my baby sister was three or so, she suddenly developed an imaginary friend. I was a tween at the time, so I was honestly quite glad that she had something to distract her other than me, considering that I was her built-in babysitter 24-7, and like all cusp of puberty kids, would much prefer watching TV than constantly entertaining a toddler. So naturally, I always encouraged her to play with said friend, and she would do so all hours of the day, giggling away in the living room as I supervised in peace. My parents too were a little bit shocked as to how taken my sister had suddenly become with her friend, but my mum would just chat away with her friend as to how funny it was. Both she and I never had imaginary friends, so we both thought that it was just sort of interesting. My dad, however, was more quiet on the subject, but I didn't think anything of it at the time. Anyway, after about a month or so, we're all in the living room and my sister is playing. My mum is on the phone with my grandmother and she suddenly calls over, What's your friend's name, baby? And my baby sister replies, Kevy. My dad immediately shoots up from his seat and he has the weirdest look on his face. He goes to my sister and asks her to say their name again. And after he does, my dad looks straight sick. Now, my dad is a guy who wears his heart on his sleeve and isn't afraid of showing his emotions, but never before had I seen such a look of raw horror on his face. Even now, 10 years later, I've never seen him so scared before. My dad runs to the back of the apartment and I follow out of curiosity, but he just calls for my mum and they shut me out of the room. Eventually, later that day or the next, my dad tells me a story. You see, he had an imaginary friend when he was little named Kevy, and considering that he was the youngest kid in his family by more than 10 years, Kevy was his best friend. He had this imaginary friend for over five years or so, and my dad told me that at first Kevy was normal, but as time went on, he got meaner and meaner, and eventually escalated into telling my dad terrible things, and that he should do terrible things. This scared the heck out of my dad, and one day he told Kevy to go away, and he just did. My dad had never told his family about the bad things Kevy had said, and they all assumed that he naturally grew out of it, and never mentioned that he had an imaginary friend to anyone, including my mother and I. He also didn't tell me exactly what Kevy had said to him either, and I didn't push, because he looked really terrified. Anyway, the next week or so, my family saged the house repeatedly, went to churches, and left cleansing tablets in all entrances to the apartment. We told my sister Kevy wasn't allowed to stay anymore, and while she was upset at first, eventually she stopped mentioning him and we never talked about it again. It has been a decade since then, and only recently has this memory come back to me after I've reconnected with my dad, and we were reminiscing about our time in that apartment. I didn't mention this event to him though. My family is very superstitious and so we completely dropped it, save for continuously saging every couple of months. This had always been a, a long buried memory and honestly, even sharing it out loud like this, it feels sort of wrong. My name is Luke, I'm from the UK and I work as a district nurse. This is a nurse who visits patients in their own homes, care homes, etc. Just not in a hospital setting. I've done my time in the hospitals, I guess you could say, but no more thank you. I've wanted to tell this for a little while now. It's short, but also I knew that I wanted to describe it properly and clear in detail. So I've been waiting for some spare time to sit down and get this out. A little bit about me before I begin. I've been a nurse for almost 20 years now. I've seen and dealt with most things that you can think of. I've always had an interest in the mysterious side of life, I guess you could say. However, it wasn't until nursing that I started to believe in ghosts. Now I question what ghosts even are. I consume paranormal podcasts, allegedly true stories, and true crime, and as I'm sure that you hear all the time, this is a true story. I'm sharing this to create a discussion, 
to reinforce that professional people can experience paranormal situations and to get it recorded before some parts are lost to time from my aging brain. I would like to hear feedback, your thoughts about what my student and I saw. So, about two years ago on a cloudy British July day, I was mentoring a third year nursing student. The nursing student was close to qualifying and was what we call a mature student. They have kids and have gone back to university later on in life. I'll call her M. M was naturally good with people. She was honest and caring. Myself and her went to see a patient, we'll call her P, who had complex needs. She needed observation, vitals, checking, bloods taking and wounds redressing. She lived in an old semi-detached house on the outskirts of a small town, and due to the complexity of the visit, I needed to collect items from my car boot. I advised M to go in and introduce herself and start her assessment on P. We give third year students more autonomy. Once I had collected all the items such as a BP monitor, HR, SBO2 monitor, blood bottles, etc, etc, I locked my car, entered the small front garden, then knocked on the white UPVC front door and walked in. The layout of the house when walking in through the front door is like this. Directly in front was a thin hallway leading to an interior door. To the left were stairs leading to the first floor, second if you're American. To the right was an open door which led into the living room where the bay window was at, the front of the property. I walked in saying hello. My eyes naturally went to the open living room where I saw an old lady. I'll describe her later. I heard my student call me from behind the door at the end of the hallway. I walked down the hallway and I opened the door where I saw M speaking to P in her kitchen area. Without concern, we carried out the care for P. M doing most of the work with little input. The whole visit probably took maybe 30 minutes. And as things were wrapping up, I asked P who the lady was in her room. She said something along the lines of, Lady? What lady? The TV's on. I said, No, the lady in your room. P said again, I'm the only one in my house. I looked at M, I guess trying to think. However, as I did... I noticed that she had gone white and her eyes were wide. She looked scared. I advised them to both hold on for two minutes. I'm now thinking that a confused lady had entered the patient's house or something. However, getting to the living room, nobody was there and no TV was on. Besides, it was a, a tiny 20 inch thing anyway. I checked upstairs, but nothing. As stated in the layout, the front door is opposite to where I was along the hall, so I would have seen or heard someone leave. I said to P that no one's there. I must need a break or something. P laughed and said her thank yous to M and myself. But before I get to what M and I discussed, here's what I saw. I saw an old lady, maybe about five foot three, short, white permed hair. She was wearing a, a brownish pleated skirt small flat dark shoes and a light blouse i think white she had her back to me and was walking away she was only about four feet away from me she was solid solid as if someone was looking at em or anyone else that i interact with i saw no part of her face and in some ways i i guess i'm glad for that in any case, when Em and I got outside the property, for my own mind and to ensure that I didn't pass any bias, I asked Em to describe exactly what she saw. She described the lady's looks perfectly, the same as I saw. The only difference was that she said that she was nearing a chair and was moving in a manner to which she was about to sit down. However, she didn't see her face like I did. This obviously really creeped me out. I mean, I think I had just seen a ghost with a witness. Did I see a ghost? Did I witness a time slip or was it a, a conscious spirit inhabiting a house that she may have lived in at one point? I do also have to say that even though she dressed in old ladies clothes, they didn't look out of date if that makes sense. What I mean is that I see other old ladies wearing similar clothes to her. 
I don't know. The whole thing really has struck a chord with me though and that's why I'm here. So, what are your thoughts? So many years ago, I became a certified nurse assistant. It was a simple job. Basically, we're taking care of adults all day. Now, I've had my fair share of scary stuff, wiping butts, cleaning poop off the floor, but these came with the job. And quite frankly, you become sort of numb to it after a while anyway. But that's not what I want to share. I wanted to tell my experience of when a patient is close to death. What I mean is that scary things tend to happen in the days leading up to it. So let's start with my first experience. I won't name names due to laws and regulations, but we'll start with Jay. Now, Jay was a retired Marine who saw combat in Vietnam and also a retired chef. Jay was one bad dude. Years of smoking created a hole in his throat, so it was hard for him to talk. Although you could understand some things. Now, the first thing to change when close to death is smell coming from one person's body. It's hard to explain, but it just sort of smells like rotting meat. I know, horrible, but when I noticed the smell on Jay, I sat with Jay and talked about life in general. I'm trying not to talk about death, but steering it that way. We finally got onto the topic and Jay's just whole attitude sort of flip-flopped. He put up a hand signaling me to stop talking. He took a deep breath and mustered up some words. Last night, there was men in my room. My heart sank, tall and, and dark, wearing top hat. I could visibly see the fear in Jay's eyes. Combat and being a sheriff in the 80s couldn't have prepared him for what he saw that night. I had a blank stare. I didn't know what to tell him. He was visibly stressed, though. He shrugged his shoulders at me and continued watching his show. Maybe an hour or so passed. Jay was in the living room and I was in the kitchen. The TV volume was up a bit due to Jay's hearing. We both sort of jumped when we heard a loud bang in his room across the way. It wasn't a normal sound, though. It sounded like somebody had chucked a piece of steak at the floor. It was such a distinctive sound. Even with Jay's hearing, he heard it too. He looked over to me with eyebrow raised. I assumed that it was somebody in the house. I looked at Jay and told him to stay put. I needed to check the house. Now, I slowly rounded the corner to the hall. I looked slowly towards his door and saw a, a shadow from under the door and finally yelled, get out of this house now or I'll call the police. I opened the door quickly, but there was nothing. Everything was untouched and in its place. Windows and curtains were left as is. I searched the whole room, but there was no one. I went back to Jay and explained what had happened. He gave me a look and said, dark man. I was frozen, scared to turn around but I quickly turned to see nothing behind me. But Jay was fixed on the corner of the hall. He could see something that I couldn't. Now, Jay being the sort of fella that he was, flipped off the air and turned back to his show. I'm freaking out now. I proceeded to search the whole house, every door and nook, under the beds, in closets, nothing. It was all empty. My shift of 12 hours was about to end. The other nurse finally arrived. I let them in and explain what was going on. But they too are creeped out since they have the overnight shift. But in the end, I left with a lot of questions and really spooked. Fast forward to the next day. I get a call saying that Jay had passed away during the night. But they had found him on the floor beside his bed. The overnight nurse heard a loud thump in the middle of the night and rushed into the room to find Jay on the floor, not breathing, no pulse. Since he had a DNR, there was nothing that we could do. Days later, it was determined that he had a heart attack and tried to leave the bed. He had rolled to the edge of the bed and his body rolled off the side, hitting the floor, making a sound like meat hitting a solid floor. 
the same sound heard the very day before by me and Jay. So, on to experience number two. I once did live in care for this man, F. F was an older gentleman. He lived in a 110-year-old Victorian home. He was a lifelong mechanic, and he was also really smart. He was diagnosed with dementia and Alzheimer's, a mix that would cause a lot of confusion and combative incidents. Besides this, though, he really was as sharp as could be. Now, this one particular night, F seemed on edge. I asked what was going on. He explained that he has recently been hearing things, that it was hard for him to sleep. I sort of shrugged it off and helped him into bed. I walked to my room and snuggled into bed, ready to sleep. A few minutes passed by and I heard a yell coming from F's room. I jumped up and ran over. F was in the corner of his bed, full fetal position, scared out of his mind. I flicked the light on and asked what's going on. F explained that there was a demon sitting on his desk in the corner watching him. He explained its skin was black like burnt and charred, its eyes sunken with black voids. He said that it smiled at him. Now, as a med professional, it is imperative that we keep a professional standpoint. But that night, I have to admit, it shook me to the core. I talked about God with him and prayed with him. All the time, F is glancing around me at the desk over and over. He had a sort of look of despair on his face. We finished talking and I head toward the door. But then, F, the manliest man that I'd ever really known, asked the weirdest question with reasonable cause. He said, will you sleep on my bed with me? I sort of chuckled and asked, why would I? He cut me off and with pure fear in his eyes says, because it has never left. It's still there. While you were praying, it was mimicking what you were saying in the sort of low demonic tone. Now, I'm completely spooked. Quite honestly, nothing could have prepared me for that response. I tried my best to keep a straight face, remember professionalism. I responded, of course, but I'll sleep on the recliner in the corner. Heedless to say, I didn't sleep that whole night. A few weeks passed and it was morning. I was helping F out of bed. He turned quickly and was fixed on the old oak stairs out the door. He was very distracted all of a sudden. He didn't speak the whole time and when we walked down the stairs, he was fixed on the top the whole time too. Anyway, we sat down for breakfast. He dropped his fork on the plate and sat back, looked me in the eyes. He pointed to the doorway in the kitchen. Are those your nieces or something? I was taken aback. What? I asked confused. Those kids there, are they with you? Now I began to feel a cold wind down my back and chills formed from my head to toe. F, there are no children there. But then I heard a child's laugh come from the staircase. I jump up. F turns toward the corner of the room and asks the wall, how long have you been dead? I screamed out, F, what are you talking about? The children, their clothes look old and their faces sort of sunken in. They look like they've been decaying for a long time. By now, I jumped up and explained that I needed a moment. I walked out of the kitchen more scared than I had ever been. I eventually collected myself and returned. F was there, unfazed, eating his eggs. And I just sat there, not knowing what to do. Now, most of my experiences have been somewhat scary, even terrifying, but definitely what tops the books is death itself. There are just so many unknowns with that. Many people fear death because the afterlife is an unexplainable thing. We only have testimonies from people who have passed for a certain number of minutes. I'm fortunate enough to have never brushed with death, but I've witnessed it firsthand a number of times. And here is one of those stories with the ending hours of F's life. So, months had passed since the whole kitchen incident. Not much scary things had happened besides the occasional noise in the house or footsteps on the oak staircase. Most of the house was original wood floors. 
Remember that this house was about 110 years old, so anomalies weren't too worrisome. I can only imagine the number of things that happened in that old house though. In those months though, F has had a steady decline in health. It had gotten to the point that he no longer would talk or eat. Hospice is involved now too. For those who don't know, it's an organization that helps with those close to death. The hospice's goal is to provide comfort. So F, most of the time, was given regular doses of morphine to make his pending passing more comfortable. I walked into F's room to make some routine vitals. I held his wrist with my pointer and middle finger looking for a pulse. Huh, strange, I said to myself. His pulse was barely there. Med personnel call it thread pulse and it was really slow. I began counting his breathing. I'm in my head watching his chest rise then fall. One, I would say to myself. I don't remember the exact count, but I do remember panicking. It was way too low for oxygen intake. Like most elderly people, DNRs are in effect, so I really couldn't do much. I knew that he would pass within a few hours, so in order to make his passing comfortable, I put up a chair. I began reading a book to him. The last thing to deteriorate is hearing, apparently. Even when comatosed, people can still hear what's around them sometimes. I was about halfway through the book. For sake of information, F has been comatosed and in a fluid state due to the morphine that he doesn't respond or move anymore. But right now, I was about to have the biggest jump scare of my life because F's eyes shot open and began scanning the room at a fast pace. He reached out and grabbed my arm. My heart hit my throat. His breathing intensified. It was quick and shallow. I began trying to pull away. I grabbed F's hand, his eyes fixed on me. I was looking right into his eyes and he had this 1,000 yard stare going on. Blank, no expression. He didn't say anything but I was petrified. I didn't move, just stared into F's eyes. His breathing slowed. A tear began to fall from his eye. I mustered up the courage. I said, it's okay F, it's time to go. Don't be afraid, I'm here with you. You're not alone. And with that, he took a deep breath and I watched his life leave his eyes. It's... Hard to explain the experience or how you can literally see life leave somebody's eyes. His grip though loosened on my arm. His hand turned ice cold. His hand fell to his side. Watching his last breath wasn't a, a fearful one. More like a relief I guess. Like it was finally over. I watched fearful eyes turn into blank dilated pupils. His head fell forward to his pillow. Eyes still locked on mine. Even after passing, his eyes stayed open. I reached for his wrist. It was still warm, but also cooling. I search for a pulse and there's nothing. I reach for his neck. No pulse. I watch his chest. No rise or fall. I check my watch. 1628, time of death. I write it down and I call hospice. They send out an RN right away. They confirm death. We call F's friend and only known trustee. She's in another state hours away. She asks though that we lock up and unplugged appliances. But that whole ordeal, man, was it traumatizing. Anyway, the coroner arrives hours later. They rolled the gurney in, unzipped their body bag. The smell alone coming from them, like death and cheap cleaner. It's a smell that I'll never forget. They walked into F's room and wrapped him into his bed sheets. They lifted him onto the gurney, wiped down his hospital bed. They had the RN and me fill out a form, gave us a card, and just like that, F's body was taken away. Now, F was single, no children, and no known family. It was the end of a family line as far as we could tell. The RN said her goodbyes and walked out. I was left alone in this giant, empty, quiet house. I began locking up the doors and the windows, turning off the lights and unplugging appliances. I walk into F's room and the coroner's smell is still lingering. I sit on the chair, still scooted up to his bedside. 
and sat there for what felt like hours. I was just thinking about everything that had happened. It was hard. Truth be told, I became depressed for a while afterward, questioning everything that I knew about life. Watching somebody's life slip away like that, while staring them directly in the face, it messes you up a bit. Anyway, I'm past it all now, but the scars, they are definitely still with me. When I was a senior in college a few years ago, I lived in an old house about a five minute walk from my campus with five of my girlfriends. It was still COVID time, so we spent a lot of time just in the house since we could not really go anywhere. To preface this as well, this house was old and many of the windows didn't lock. Our landlord sucked as many colleges ones do and didn't do anything to fix the issue. But with it being six of us and often a boyfriend or two sleeping in the house, it felt mostly safe and many of us would keep our windows open anyway. Our college was in a town just outside of the second most dangerous city in the state, but right around the campus it felt relatively safe. Anyway, when the weather started getting warmer in early spring, we would sit out on the roof to sunbathe and this roof faced our street. We would access the roof from our roommates, let's call her Mary, her bedroom window on the second floor since it led straight to the roof. Our street was residential and it didn't get a ton of traffic, but we did have a couple of encounters of younger guys catcalling us as they drove by, but nothing seemed sinister as we were college kids. One night though, late in the semester, Mary went up to her room to call her brother while the rest of us were hanging downstairs. That was when she rushed downstairs and said that she saw a ladder leading up to the roof where we would all sunbathe and right near her window, which was open. Later we learned she said out loud to her brother what she saw before she came down. When she told us this, my other roommate and her boyfriend ran outside to find a man running away from our house with the ladder, who we assume heard Mary telling her brother she saw the ladder and knew that he was caught. It was dark, so they could not make out anything about him. I immediately texted our landlord asking if he had someone to come by the house to do any work, and he said no. We then called the police who came by. They did some investigating and patrolled our house for a couple of nights, but we never found out who the man was, what his intentions were, or even if perhaps he had been there before. This happened when I was 14. I'm 29 as of the time of sharing this, but I remember this story from time to time, meaning like once or twice every few years. It still gets me in a weird mood for some reason too. Anyways, I was walking with one of my friends in the city the other day. I tried holding her hand, but then she thought that I just bumped into her and apologized, so I was able to recover smoothly. Then I saw a group of kids skateboard past us and lo and behold, that was the thing that sparked this memory, so I figured that I'd write it down. I'm not going to use this kid's real name, so I'll just call him Vinny. I come from a town where the people you went to school with in kindergarten were the same kids that you graduated with. Vinny moved to our school about halfway through the year. When new kids came to our school, everybody would always flock to them. At 14, I was kind of a dork, but also kind of a douche, which made me surprisingly likable to most people for some reason. Vinny would always sit by himself during lunch. Something I found amusing about him was that he would get infuriated if people asked him if he skated. I took that as a challenge to try and get to him, and it worked. The first time he and I had class together, I remember the teacher asking him if he had his books yet. He responded with, my wife never confirmed my school schedule with the front office. I remember everybody thought that that was funny. You're 14 years old and you have a wife? He was clearly trying to get one over on the teacher. My friends and I were skating after school and we saw Vinny at some point. I remember talking to my friends about what he said and we all became oddly infatuated with this kid. It took some doing, but after about a week of letting him hang out with us... 
he became one of the boys. One of my buddies asked if we could go sleep at his house on a Friday night, under the guise that we took turns at staying at each other's houses to skate, play video games, and smoke the green stuff. He looked perturbed, which is something I wish mattered to me back then, but the next day at school, he did say that it was okay after asking his parents. My buddies and I rode our bikes to where he lived, with clothes for the night, and our skateboards strapped to our bags. We met his family, who at face value seemed completely fine. But then things got a little bit weird. What I mean is that first, his dad had a huge weapons collection. At the time, I thought that it was pretty awesome, to be honest. He even took us out into a field by a canal to shoot some of his assault rifles. I know, I know, that wasn't cool of him with our parents' consent. Next, we met Vinny's wife. Yeah, the girl was real. She was also 26. And while we did live in the southern US, yeah, I know, I know, even this was taboo. That they would like hold hands and stuff, and at the time we honestly thought that it was pretty cool. It was like dating a senior when you're a freshman, only he was in high school and she paid taxes. Things kind of got to a new level of weird though when Vinny's dad had his arm around Vinny's mum and his other arm around a girl that couldn't have been terribly older than we were at the time. Apparently, that was also his wife. We then spent about two hours praying with the family in the living room. I was raised Catholic, but couldn't determine which religion that they were practicing. Once we finished with that, we went outside to start skateboarding. After a few minutes, his dad came outside and ordered us into the house. Vinny's mother then had us stand in line outside of the bathroom to take a bath. It still skeeves me out that too, but I remember that we weren't allowed to drain the water from the tub. I was the last one to bathe. Also, all of the mirrors in the house were covered with sheets. I have no idea the significance of this. It makes more sense to me to not have mirrors at that point. But we were told to go to bed, even though the sun wasn't even down yet. Vinny went to bed with his wife. The three of us that remained just laid there in one single queen-sized bed and talked about how much fun we weren't having. But the final straw for the night was having to hear Vinny's parents, and maybe the other woman, doing the dirty in the next room. It was almost 11pm when we decided to just get on our bikes and leave. It was dark and we had to ride through some pretty bad neighborhoods, but we made it safe to my buddy's house. Vinny's mother would also later call our parents and leave some pretty cryptic messages which implied trouble. Vinny was pulled from school about a week later and after that we never saw him again. Now, I don't know what that family was into. Maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought it was as a kid and I just didn't understand something. All I do know is that we felt incredibly uncomfortable so uncomfortable that we decided to leave. I have no issues with religion, but if this was part of their practice, I think it's a little bit weird. Out of curiosity, I went to find Vinny on Facebook. All I can confirm is that he, his mother, father, and one of his sisters had died. There were no public records of what happened to them, or if they even died at the same time or anything. It was a really bizarre experience and one that I'll never forget. It's something that I come back often to as well and I think it's worth the tell. I do wish I had a bit more information about the family and what happened to them, but I guess I may just never know. This did not happen recently. I believe that this was when I was maybe 9 to 11 years old. I'm currently 17. So me and my best friend, Katie, are at our elementary school park. We often hung out at this park due to us both living on either side of it, so it was massively convenient. Our city is dangerous as it is known for high rates of robberies, sexual assault, and even human trafficking because of a major highway that runs through our city. Me and her rode our bikes to our favorite picnic table that day, and this table is positioned to where we can clearly see the church across the street, keep this in mind, and also all street intersections. 
It's a spot that we can all see with no obstructions. So, we're sitting on the top of the table and simply talking about whatever it is that a kid is talking about. When suddenly, I had a weird feeling and I look up. We're facing the church across the street. We are not far from this street, but we're far enough that I question what I saw. This grown man is wrestling with this very small child outside of his car. The back door of his car is open. I'm unsure if the child was walking alone because I was not looking at the time. I also do not know where the car pulled up. In any case, me and Katie are staring, horrified, and we're completely silent and transfixed on what is happening. And suddenly, he picks the child up and throws them into the back of the car. He runs around to the driver's side and speeds off. This happens in the span of like 30 seconds, maybe to a minute. Now, the reason why I'm unsure on what I saw is because I didn't hear the child make any noise, but we were far enough away that we may not have heard anything to begin with. The child was also in a very large neon orange construction jacket, to the point of where it may not have been a child at all. That is how large the jacket was. If it wasn't a child, then why on earth would he throw that person into their car like that? and then speed off. What I mean is that when he threw the jacket or the child, he put a lot of effort into it, meaning that it was heavier than a jacket lift. After this, we just stood there silently. We eventually were just like, what the heck was that? We got onto our bikes and sped off to her house, and I think about it regularly. Me and her are still best friends. We haven't brought it up in a very long time, I'm really not sure if she even remembers this, but it always haunts me. Did I witness a child being kidnapped? A parent abusing their kid? Or something that looked really sinister, but wasn't whatsoever? It's a confusing event, and I've explained it as best as I could, but I don't know. Something tells me that it was a kid being kidnapped. So for context, my family was on holiday in Spain at a resort where you have a sort of small bungalow type building to yourself with different rooms. At this time I was around 8, my sister 10 and my brother around 16. The first thing that happened was when me, my mum and my sister were sleeping in the same bed due to an arrangement between my parents and as I was the smallest, I had to lay across the bottom horizontally towards the doorway. I woke up and saw my sister out of bed at one point, which is not unusual in itself. However, she was wearing a very specific onesie that would never be packed for a holiday to Spain, but one that we definitely had at home. Last I remembered, both my sister and I were wearing a vest and pants to bed, so I look over to where she was before, and she's sound asleep, not in the onesie. The next morning I looked and we didn't bring it. A day after that, my sister told me to stop walking around at night as it was creeping her out. I never did this, so I asked her to explain. She said that she saw me creeping around the bed apparently, and when she called out to me, I said shush. Years later, I was telling my mum about it, and she said that she also saw me creeping around my parents' bed, and that my dad started waking up at like 3.15 every night that we were there unprompted. My parents also had the worst fights while we were there. I'm pretty skeptical, but I am wondering, was there something more to this than just illusions? Back in 2001, when I was a senior in high school, I landed my first girlfriend that I was madly in love with. Her family took me in as if I was an extra son to them, so I spent the better part of the following year there after school. My girlfriend and I would get home from school before her parents would get back from work, so we usually sat in the kitchen eating snacks and doing homework. One day, my girlfriend comes down from her bedroom and walks down the stairs normally. 
but quickly darts down the hall to get back into the kitchen where I'm seating at the table. I ask her why she was acting so weird. She then goes on to tell me that when she had reached the bottom of the stairs, she apparently saw an older man with a great long white beard standing in the study. I go and investigate and there was nothing there. I then ask if she thought that she saw a ghost and she doesn't know what she saw but what she described was what was it. I slightly mocked her that how could this house be haunted. They were the second owners of it after all and it wasn't even older than 10 years. Previously to the neighborhood being built, it was just woods as well. Anyway, some time passes. At this point, I can't remember how long, but the subject never came up again. That was until I personally saw something. In a similar situation, but roles reversed, I started to walk into the kitchen when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man in their dining room, which was off to the right of the kitchen, sitting at the head of the table, wearing what looked like a green velvet suit or a suit that would not be common in this day and age. I turned my head fully and there was nothing. I tell my girlfriend but rule out the fact that maybe her sighting had influenced my imagination or something. To note as well, I do believe the possibility to there being more in this life than we can normally perceive but I am very much skeptical. Fast forward to the summer and her friend from Brazil is here visiting for their winter break. My girlfriend and myself are in their room being teenagers and her friend who was giving us some space comes bursting through the doors in tears. She is rapidly speaking Portuguese describing that she was downstairs listening to her CD player when she ran into a man with a long white beard in the study. This more or less convinced me as well. I mean, there was really no reason why my girlfriend would have told her friend, as again the subject never really came up again, and she had no interest in the subject other than her own observation. Fast forward to a few weeks ago, my now ex-girlfriend is back in the United States with her parents, we go out to dinner together and I bring up the subject. Her mum matter of factly says, yeah I saw people all the time, usually on the first floor and the basement. I just never said anything to be strong for our kids. Her dad then chimes in about being convinced that they would live in that house when it hadn't been on the market, while searching for a home in the neighborhood that is, that something told him that they would live there. The next day the house went onto the market and they moved in shortly afterwards. So we have three spectator counts, I rule myself out that a harmless ghost that fits a, a similar description was in that house. Uh, to this day, I, I want to send a letter to the current family asking if they've seen the bearded man. But I don't know. This all happened in Connecticut, by the way, and I would really like to get back there and see it again. So this happened about seven months ago. I was visiting San Diego for job interviews and staying at my favorite hotel in Sorrento Mesa. For some background, I'm a 40 year old guy and a pretty big guy at that. I'm 6'1 and also a former strip club bouncer. So on my third night, I was pretty late after hanging out with some old friends after my interviews. I got back to the hotel at around two in the morning with some Sunny's donuts. After eating a few, drinking a few more, and watching South Park, post-COVID, I decided to have a smoke before going to bed. This made it now around 3 in the morning. Eventually, I go downstairs, walk out the front to the smoking area by the fountain, but there's another couple who are also staying at the hotel already there. I didn't want to impose myself upon them, so I decided to just walk around the outside parts of the hotel while I smoked. I walked around the pool, the barbecue area, the basketball courts, then started back toward the side door. As I did, a black sedan drove up alongside of me and stopped. The window rolled down and a tiny Asian woman asked if I knew how to get out of the parking lot and back to the street. Now, from where we were when she asked me, this was literally in a straight line about 150 feet in front of her, so... 
I honestly thought that she was drunk or just blind. So I politely said, yeah, just keep going straight and turn left at the tree. She then asked me if I could get into the car and show her. Now, again, I'm a former strip club bouncer, and this woman looked very much like Walmart Ali Wong. What I mean is that there was absolutely no intimidation factor, but for some reason I instantly felt uneasy. Again, it was literally right in front of her. She could see the road. Also, the windows were all tinted far more than they should have been, and I honestly couldn't tell if somebody else was in the car at this point. I used the smoking as an excuse to not get into the car, but she said that she didn't mind and gave me a, a really creepy smile. I politely declined and again pointed out that the road was literally right there, so I'd just be walking back in like five seconds anyway. She again asked if I could get in and show her though. This was feeling like a weird kid or sort of ice cream truck situation. I mean, guys, how often do decently looking women just drive up and ask you to get into their car at 3 in the morning in a hotel parking lot, right? How often does anyone ask a big bearded guy to just hop in their car under these circumstances? Nothing about this was right. Again, though, I politely declined as I finished my smoke and was luckily already standing right at the hotel side door when all of this started, so I just went in. The woman, she drove off as she rolled up the window, right exactly to the exit she had asked me to show her to. So I told the front desk about it, and they said that they would keep an eye on it, but I'm quite sure that nothing was ever done or came of it. It's just one of those things, though, that really makes me wonder, what the heck did she actually want me in the car so badly for? I mean, a pretty man? I am not, so... It had to be some kind of scam. I just wonder exactly how much danger I was actually in. My mother worked long shifts at the airport seven days a week. So me, 12-year-old female, and my younger sister, 10-year-old female, were at home by ourselves majority of the time. For reference too, we lived in a house that had gates on the windows and a gated door that we had to unlock to get to the actual front door. It was late at night at about 10pm and me and my sister were watching TV and preparing for bed. It was around this time that I noticed some sounds coming from our front door and realized that it was someone banging on the gate. I was naive back then and decided to open the door to see who it was. It was a young white man in his late 20s. He had a black and white striped shirt with a jean packet. I asked him what he needed and he sat there with a blank face and said calmly that he needed me to let him in. I asked him why and he repeated himself and said, let me in, I'm in trouble. He kept looking back over his shoulder and I felt a bit unnerved and decided not to unlock the gate for him. As soon as I made the decision not to let him in, the police showed up and pulled their guns on this guy. They gave him directions to walk backwards with his hands up and at that moment, I decided now was the time to close the door. I quickly realized that he may have been running from the police for a crime that he committed. Till this day, I wonder if I would have opened that door and let him in, what might have actually happened. It's something I try not to dwell on too much. My parents got divorced in 1997. I was born in 1990, so I was seven at the time. They stayed friends, but my mum moved out to my grandparents' old house. My grandparents had quite a lot of money and had recently moved without selling the house, so there was no problem for them to let my mother and us to move to their old home. We ended up living there for about five years too. It was me, my mother, and my two sisters, who both are a few years older than me, and our dog. What I'm going to tell you is not in chronological order, since I can't remember when everything happened, but I assure you that... Everything that I share is 100% true. So, 
The house had three floors, ground floor, basement, and upper floor, where me and my sister slept. The basement was the most horrific place in the house. The stairs led from the basement up to the first floor, then to the second floor, sort of like a spiral, and most of the steps would creak and make lots of sound when stepping on them. Several times a week, you would hear footsteps slowly walking from the basement up the stairs, taking a short break at the ground floor, then keep moving to the second floor. Most of the times, the steps would stop at my older sister's room, but it would vary and sometimes stopping outside of my room or my middle sister's room as well. But we all heard it. My mum did not like to talk about it, but my sisters and I, we often talked about it the day after and confirmed hearing it outside whatever room it stopped by. We all hated going down to the basement though. It was a huge basement that you would think children would enjoy playing in, but we just hated it. Our dog also never went down to the basement as well. She seemed to hate it just as much as we did. But all kinds of minor things happened down in that basement. The light would turn off randomly, things would move, and you could often hear sort of stuff moving down there, even though nobody was supposed to be down there. One evening, me and my sisters were playing with walkie-talkies, trying to get to the local police channel, the things kids did during the 90s. This time, though, the voice in the walkie-talkie was different and sounded much closer. The voice said all kinds of things. It was speaking directly to my older sister and said that it was going to hurt her. It even spoke her name, but I don't think it ever answered our questions. We got scared and turned off the walkie-talkie. A minute or so later, our dog ran into our room and barked out into nothing. Our dog was large and very protective of us kids and kept staying in the room barking, which had never really happened before or even afterward. Another time, me and my mum were home, but my sisters and dog were away. I was playing up in my room and my mum was doing whatever mums do, when suddenly I hear really loud footsteps from the basement, even though I was on the second floor in my room, walking, almost running actually, up from the basement, then continuing up the stairs to the second floor. I remember my heart just sort of stopped when listening to the footsteps. My mum never walks that heavy and angry. The footsteps continued though until outside of my room, then stopped, and my door was suddenly slammed really hard. The door closed and I screamed and began to cry. My mum raced up the stairs and tried to open the door, but she couldn't. It was as if the door was locked, though I don't think the door even had a locking mechanism. My mum shouted to me to be calm while she ran down to get the tools to tear the door down. While she was down and seven, eight-year-old me was crying, the door just suddenly unlocked itself and opened. Another time when my sisters and my dog were away, there was a storm and for some reason I was deathly afraid of the thunder. I've never been afraid of thunder before or afterward, but this night for whatever reason I was and... In the basement, everything just went absolutely crazy. We heard things thrown down there, glass shattering, which we confirmed in the morning after that because we saw glass and stuff had been thrown around and shattered everywhere. There were footsteps running up and down the stairs and me and my mother hugged each other, both scared of what we were hearing. At one time, we were sitting in the living room just being deathly scared. The entrance door flew open, then closed, opened and closed again for like several minutes. We sat there huddled together until eventually the storm left and everything just seemed to stop. Many more minor things happened too, but these are what came to my mind and it seemed to me that it got worse when my dog was not around for whatever reason. And it was more after my older sister and even though I told you about the things that happened to me, she has many more experiences than I do. A couple of times she claimed that she even saw an old man watching her sleep, which is really creepy to think about. I haven't really talked to anyone about these experiences, except my mum and sisters, so it's good to get it off my chest. If you have any questions about the house or the experiences, then please do just ask. 
We lived in the house around 1997 to 2002 and we moved just after that. So my parents went away for the weekend because it was their wedding anniversary. It was just me in the house. I'm 19. I do have a sister who's 17 but she went to stay over at a friend's house that night. So it was just me and the dog and earlier that day I had washed my bed sheets and put them in the dryer. A few hours later when I went back to see if they had dried I found out that they didn't and it turns out the dryer had actually broken which was pretty annoying. I phoned my parents and told them what had happened. I went to look to see if I could find any bed sheets to put on my bed until mine dried but there really wasn't any apart from my sisters who didn't fit my bed. I just decided that I'll sleep in my parents bed since it was pretty comfy anyway. Later that night I'm in bed and my dog is sleeping next to me and I've got my parents door slightly open just in case the dog wants to go out of the room in the night. I'm there just watching YouTube while waiting to feel tired enough to sleep when suddenly I get a very weird feeling come over me. It felt like someone was watching me and though it was a pretty freaky feeling I was with my dog so I wasn't completely scared or alone. I turned the lamp on and tried to fall asleep because my phone was about to die. It's almost 3 in the morning, I think it was like 2.55 when I woke up and I don't normally wake up randomly at those times but I look over and my dog is asleep at the bottom of the bed. I look to the door and see what looked like someone kneeling on the floor and kind of holding themselves up by resting on the wall. I was looking for probably a minute to work out what I was actually looking at and it looked like a person so I hid under the blanket and stayed under there for a few minutes. Eventually I got the courage to look and when I did whatever was there was now gone. This may seem comforting to others but to me it was way more troubling. I would have preferred if whatever the shadow was had stayed there because that would have meant that I was probably just seeing something like a shadow being cast from something in the room or whatever. The fact that it was gone suggests that there was actually something or someone there. I didn't properly go to sleep after that. It was around 5ish in the morning when I did finally fall asleep and now my sleep schedule is kind of ruined. I'm not really sure what that whole thing was about. I mean there was nothing by the door that could have made a shape that matches someone kneeling and leaning against the wall like that. I don't think my house is haunted because this is the first time anything has happened and my parents house isn't extremely old. It was built in the 80s. This was a few days ago and everybody is now home, thank the lord. And nothing has happened since but I would like to know if you guys have any suggestions as to what I should do about this. I'm a 29 year old woman. I live in an apartment in a sketchier side of my town. So I'm not unaccustomed to strange people pulling up and strange things happening. I've been through a home break-in so I'm very hyper vigilant when it comes to keeping myself and my home safe. I also smoke cigarettes, it's a nasty habit I know but having cats and not wanting my house to reek like smoke I'll walk out to my balcony to smoke. That is exactly what I was doing when this happened too. I was sitting on my balcony smoking and just enjoying my night when I noticed a car that I'd never seen before pull into the back parking lot of my apartment right by my balcony. I initially felt a bit off but I didn't want to come off as being the paranoid neighbor so I keep sitting and smoking my cigarette. Then I hear footsteps making a beeline through my backyard. There's a large and burly man that I'd never seen before walking briskly through my backyard. Again I still don't try to make much of it because well they might be there for my neighbor or something. My anxiety is definitely on alert but not in panic mode is what I'm getting at. Until I realize that he's going straight for my portion of the backyard. He then does something that is still freaking me out as I share this. 
He stops right in my backyard, looks up at me on my balcony, not saying a word. I'm sort of panicking now. I audibly say, heck no, spring up, slam and lock my balcony door, run to my upstairs bathroom, and dial 911. I listened to every sound from downstairs while I stood panicking in my bathroom and truthfully, it sounded like someone was messing with my back door at this point. I don't know for sure because I was in hypervigilant mode. I do know though that he was in my backyard for a few minutes because I was in my bathroom for several minutes until I decided to peek out of my balcony window. I saw him walking to his car and getting in, which also tells me that I don't think that he was there to rob me but perhaps something more sinister. Luckily, he was lazy because, again, I live on the cheaper side of town, so you can imagine the quality of my doors and locks. I'm really hoping that it was just some guy who was drunk or high and had the wrong house or whatever, but my gut is telling me otherwise. Regardless, I just hope that this doesn't happen again. My cousin and I are the same age. We're both women and currently 25 years old. She's only five days younger than me and her family rented a floor in my parents' house when we were toddlers. So we basically did everything together and spent all of our days together until we turned five when her family bought an apartment in another city, uh, some 30 kilometers away from the city that I lived in. Since we had a very strong connection, almost codependent, it was very difficult for us to get used to not living together, and two years later, we had made an arrangement with our parents that we'll visit each other each weekend, and during the summer break she'll spend one week at our place and I'll spend the other week at their place, and we all basically exchanged like that until the end of the summer break. This went on for years too. Since we were spending all of our free time together, by the time that we turned 10 or 11, we have already exhausted all of our adventure ideas in the backyard. Tree climbing, building a tree house, setting up tents, camping in the backyard, etc. We really needed something new, so we had decided to go fishing together every Friday on the river near my house. It's a 20 minute walk away. Now, of course, we didn't have any tools needed for a true fishing experience. We had a butterfly net that we would place in the water and on a good day, we would catch about a dozen of tiny fish with it. That was enough for our restaurant game that we would like to play. We would come back home, bake the fish under the sunlight and then serve it and decorate it into plastic plates that we would later serve to our imaginary customers. We've done this for weeks at this point and always made sure that we were safe while doing it. We never actually got into the river is what I'm saying. And that wasn't that difficult since it's a very peaceful neighborhood. We call it the Yellow Bridge. And there was usually no one else at the river at the time that we were there. But one day, it was different. Very different. This is how I remember it as well. So, a couple of days ago, the memory of this encounter suddenly spilled out into my mind. We were either 10 or 11 years old. It was a Friday. She was at our place that week, so we took the butterfly net and went fishing on the river. We were alone, sitting under a large willow tree right next to the river. And suddenly, a man just showed up from well, what seemed like nowhere. He was standing a couple of meters away from us. He had blackish hair with plenty of shades of grey in it, so I'm guessing that he was probably in his late 40s or early 50s. He had a dark blue t-shirt, a little smudged on the collar. He asked us what we were doing and we said that we were fishing. He continued walking back and forth on that part of the shore, now under the yellow bridge. The shore itself is at least 500 meters long. He could have gone anywhere, but he stayed where we were at. Then he came a little bit closer and we got up. He then told us that he was apparently having issues with his wife and we just nodded our heads, trying to avoid the conversation and follow the don't talk to strangers rule. We didn't ask him anything. He took a flip phone out of his pocket and he opened it in front of us. I have to show you my wife, he said. Uh, okay, we replied. When he found what he was looking for, he came even closer and turned the phone towards us. 
It was a picture of a completely naked woman sitting in a chair with her legs apart. We just nodded. He then proceeded to show us more pictures and it was quite clear that it wasn't his wife because the pictures were not of the same woman, but all of them were inappropriate from head to toe. And now that I think of it, the quality of the images, the fashion and the aesthetics could be best described as, well, inappropriate content from the 70s that you'd probably find in a magazine if you catch my drift. It could have been that he took pictures from an old magazine or had them sent by someone, I don't know, but I remember that I looked at my cousin and mouthed, it's not his wife, and she nodded. Isn't she beautiful, he asked. Uh, yeah, she is, I replied, and my cousin nodded. We then remembered that we had left our net in the river, so we went back to the willow tree and reached for the net. He was standing there in the same spot as before, looking at his phone. He then showed us very low quality pictures of men and other women in other suggestive positions. And these pictures actually look like pictures taken with a flip phone camera. This is me, he said, and pointed at one of the men in the picture. We just nodded and we said that we had to go home at this point. But he then said the words that honestly have been haunting me for days now. You think my wife is beautiful? She thinks you're beautiful too. She would love to meet you. Come with me to meet her and we can play together. Uh, no, we have to go home, I replied. Ah, uh, you little party breaker. Maybe your friend doesn't want to go home. Come on, I want to play with you, he said and turned to my cousin. No, I really want to go home, my cousin replied. Now, this is where the details of the memory sort of stop for me. What I remember next is him giving up, just not being there anymore and us leaving, giggling and laughing as we walked away and mocked his voice and his tone on our way back home. But I found it weird that only after so many years had I remembered this situation and I've brushed it off as a potential dream or false memory even. But since his words kept echoing in my head, I called my cousin and described my memory word for word as I've described it here pretty much. And she said that it did happen, just slightly different from how I remembered it. She explained that all the details are correct, but once she told him that she really wants to go home, he was way too close and we were too scared to start running or turn our backs since we thought that he would catch us. So we stayed there for a while and kept pretending like he was not there. We played with our catch, the tiny fish in a bucket filled with water, and talked about our fathers who work in the police. Obviously, it was a lie. Her father is a forest ranger and mine works in IT. And how they're so strong and they could kill a man with one punch. The man didn't believe our exaggerated story, and apparently he kept walking in circles around us. Not too close, but he did keep an eye on us the entire time. So we waited, and waited, and waited, and at one point, he went into the bushes behind us to pee. This is when we got up and we started running. We ran across the bridge and kept running until we got to the part of the neighborhood where there are lots of houses. When we were already close to my house, I stopped in the middle of the road and said that my legs won't move. So she helped me get down on the side of the road and we sat there until I felt better. Then apparently we started joking. Today I know that what I experienced was a state of shock. Once I felt better, we went back home, threw away the fish, and after that, we decided never to go fishing again. We never told our parents because we knew that what had happened had something to do with inappropriate material, and at that time, we thought that everything related to that topic was shameful and shouldn't be talked about. She said, though, that she was surprised that I thought it was a dream and that I didn't remember it until now since I have had such an extreme reaction and she has PTSD from that event. Even today, she's not going alone anywhere and is terrified whenever someone mentions that same yellow bridge. So my encounter happened in February of 2007. I used to work third shift at a paper stock factory warehouse 
The main day shift supervisor was on vacation, so our boss on night shift decided that she wanted to leave early. She let us sneak off about two hours earlier than our normal shift end time, so this would have been between 4.30 and 5am. Now, I was following a co-worker down this county road, as the warehouse was on the outskirts of my small rural town. I noticed that he had hit his brakes and proceeded to swerve off the road. I'm not far behind him and I'm thinking to myself, what the heck is this dude doing? And that was when I saw it. There was a, a tall dark shape strolling down the middle of the road in a sort of hunched over and swaying side to side sort of manner. I have likened it to how one of those tall windblower figures that you see swaying at a car dealership or something like that moved. A very unnatural movements. It's hard to do it justice by describing it as it would only really make sense if someone saw it themselves, I, I feel like. It looked like a, a tall person wrapped in a large dark blanket or cloak or something. I had to hit the brakes and swerve too, but I came to a full stop. Whatever it was, I couldn't make out any features or characteristics. I saw a large torso with two legs. The upper half was sort of hunched forward as if it was leaning like an older person would with a walker. At that time, I was driving a 1998 Ford Explorer, and I've looked up the height of the vehicle. It lists at around 6'7", but whatever walked past my driver's window was a good foot or more higher than that, also leaning forward. So, I believe that whatever it was, it was at least seven feet tall minimum. Again though, I really couldn't see any head, any arms, just a figure with legs walking. My taillights illuminated it though as I started to drive past it. I couldn't make out any definite details for the body. I didn't see fur, skin, or anything like clothing. It was solid too, not like a translucent type of thing. It was just large thick and black or at the very least dark gray in color. My co-worker had pulled over into a parking lot a little ways down the road. I followed him in and you could tell that he was scared. He was saying something along the lines of what was that? It didn't have a head among a lot of other things most panic people say. We decided to drive back down and try to see if it was still there and what it actually was. I had drove in front and he was following behind. We came up to the general area and I noticed that there's a large black animal lying in the middle of the road. It appeared to be a, a big black dog. Part of me knew that this wasn't large enough to be what was walking in the road, but we had to stop because it was directly in the middle of the roadway. I decided to get out and walk up to it, all the while my coworker is yelling at me to get back in my vehicle. As I approach whatever is laying on the road though, it brings its head up and looks back at me. Its eyes are glowing yellow, which I write off as eye shine from the headlights, but it also growls at me. So I stop dead in my tracks and just watch it. This thing then stands up on its back legs like a person, but falls back down. It sits back up and sort of hobbles off to the side of the road, like a wounded animal that wasn't able to use its front legs. It looked like your typical German Shepherd or wolf type face, but its fur was puffy like a chow dog's. It was a lot bigger than most dogs, but still nowhere as tall as whatever was walking down the road earlier. I didn't see any blood or wounds, so I can't say if it was actually hurt or not. My co-worker got out of the car at this point after it had disappeared into the wood line. We discussed what the heck just happened, but while we were talking, I noticed next to our feet was a mouse. It was just standing there with us, but it was cleaning itself. I nudged it with my shoe and it just kept cleaning its face as if it wasn't afraid of us. The mouse was sitting in an upright position as in it was on its hind legs and using its front paws to wipe itself. I never really considered it until recently that all three of these bizarre happenings were all on two legs. In any case, we got back into the vehicles and drove off and then the next time at work I had mentioned what happened and our co-workers sort of laughed at us so the other guy who saw it told me that if I don't stop talking about it, He's just going to deny it and 
best just forget about it. So for essentially 15 years, I've never told anyone up until recently. I have tried to rationalize it into something that makes sense, but even then it just doesn't completely add up. I've tried to explain it away as it was just a large dog that must have gotten hit by another vehicle before my coworker and I got there. Maybe it was messing around with the mouse and it got hit which broke its front legs so that's why it was trying to use its back legs like that. The mouse was traumatized from the dog trying to mess with it so it was just standing there cleaning the dog slobber off of itself. That sounds at least plausible until the original thing that we saw walking without a head comes up again. The dog was nowhere as tall as that thing was, so even with the dog standing upright, it was close to maybe six foot roughly, but whatever was walking had to have been well over seven feet tall as it was so much taller than my explorer, even with it hunched forward like that. So I can explain away the dog and the mouse, but I cannot just explain what that was. So I always come back to square one, trying to understand what it could have possibly been. As someone who's always been very skeptical, it becomes very hard to accept the unacceptable. I've always been interested in weird creatures and such, but I never truly believed that they existed. I still struggle to believe that all these crazy stories could be true, and yet, who am I to say that they're not? Especially with the weird stuff that my former co-worker and I went through that night. All I know is what I saw, but whatever I saw is something that I don't know and probably never will. It sounds crazy, I know, and I personally would be hesitant to believe it if somebody else told me this happened to them as well. All I can say is that that is what happened. I've been staying with my fiance pretty regularly in the last few years. Now I'm staying in this house pretty much full time. There's always been something in this house, a presence. I think it used to live in the hallway, but has since also moved to the living room. We even used to joke about it, called it by a name, which I'm not going to use here because I feel like I've sort of tempted fate enough already at this point. Now, you could already almost always feel this being and saw it lurking at the end of the hallway once or twice. But since I moved in, things have begun to really ramp up. It started with whistling at like 5 in the morning. I heard it, my girl heard it, the dog even heard it. Since then though, this thing has repeatedly knocked on the door while I'm home alone. It has growled at me twice from the dark living room in the middle of the night. And now I've woken up with scratches on my leg too. Also, to add, whatever it is, it knows my name. Not only did it just call my name and bang on the closed door of the bedroom, it also called me by my dead name. The first name that I used when I came out, one that I haven't used in years. Then it called me by my middle name. I'm honestly scared, and other than burning this place to the ground, what can I do? I was around nine years old. My friend and me were playing outside of our school. There was an event going on and it already got dark outside. We ran around and to understand what happened next, you need to understand the layout of the schoolyard. So it was a big square with high bushes opposite of the school walls. It was just a straight line where kids would run and hide. There was space for about two people maybe standing next to each other between the bushes and a fence to a pavement. Every 10 meters or so, there was an opening into this space between bush and fence. So my friend and me, we're running around and then disappear into the bushes laughing. We walked behind the bushes. Like I said, only a straight line was possible behind the bushes. It kind of stopped and looked straight ahead. There was a bus stop, the one that I used for like 8 years when I became 10. It was about maybe 15-20 meters away from us. And there was a woman standing there. She was looking straight ahead, but we only saw her right side profile. She had a white dress on, and that was when I noticed that 
I couldn't see any feet. She was hovering there. I didn't see any features, in fact. She was more like a smudge. That's what I thought it was at first, too. Just my eyes playing tricks on me. Until I looked at my friend staring also at her. We both kind of looked at each other confused. And then, scaring the life out of me, this smudge turned her head around, looked at us, and came closer at an alarming speed. We both screamed and ran outside the bushes to the middle of the yard, trying to catch our breath. I asked her what she saw, thinking that maybe I just startled her and caused her to scream because I screamed. But to my horror, she described the exact same thing that I saw. Us being stupid nine-year-olds, we started laughing, I think, and me being always the one stirring things up, I suggested to go back and check out if she was still there. My laughing stopped when I went behind the bushes and spotted her standing there again at that bus stop. And yet again, she slowly looked at us and started to come closer. This time we screamed and ran back inside the school. I remember not telling anyone anything because I knew that they wouldn't believe me. I've only told this story to a handful of people. I also lost contact with this friend, but I wish that I could talk to her again and ask her if she remembers this day as clearly as I do. So I genuinely have no clue why I haven't said anything about this yet, considering so much weird stuff happens in my life. But this was probably one of the creepiest encounters that I've ever had, and I feel lucky that I walked away. So one summer night a few years ago, I was out for a drive with a friend. We decided to make a little late night stop at a nearby waterfall for a little bit of a smoke sesh, since it was always super dead and really peaceful in the evenings. This specific time, I didn't make it anywhere near the waterfall, but... As we were getting out of the car, I, a 19-year-old female at the time, really had to pee. Now, I used to go to this waterfall very often, and I know that area like the back of my hand, even in the dark. So I went and found a spot where it was too dark for me to see more than maybe two feet in front of me. I tried to stay as close to the forest exit as possible without being seen by a, a semi-busy road. The entire time I was up there... I absolutely know that I was being watched, very closely. I ended up getting out of there as fast as I possibly could, jumping in the car and locking the doors. That entire time, I could feel someone's eyes digging into me like daggers though. I was genuinely ready to be grabbed. What confirmed I was definitely being watched happened when I got back to the car and I saw a kid run across the street directly up to where I was. He came from nowhere too, a literal cliff on one side and hence the waterfall, and I could genuinely only describe him as the little boy from the jungle book, clothing and all. I get majorly weird vibes every time that I go there now that I've never ever got before. It still has a weird feeling in the day and I genuinely don't know how this happens so quickly. The kid would have had to have scaled a large cliff and moved at a super, super high speed. I'm going with the most logical explanation in my city, which is people living in the woods with possible ulterior motives. But at this point, I'm not ruling anything out. This was by far the weirdest and creepiest encounter that I've had in a long time, that I recall. And it has honestly just kind of stuck with me. I hate going to this waterfall now, which absolutely sucks because it's so close to my house and it's really gorgeous. But I don't know, I just get the weirdest vibes when I go there now. Also, just before anything else is said, I know how stupid this was, but I was 19 and I'm stubborn as all and so nothing would have talked me out of peeing in a place where I need a flashlight. Safe to say, though, that I have not been back to that part of the park since. It has taken me many years to tell this story out of both fear and embarrassment, but I share this today as more than simple therapy for myself, but also as a warning to all people. 
be careful who you might meet on social media. So in 2018, my ex-husband and I were at the end of a very tumultuous marriage. He and I had been polyamorous for about three years before I met this guy. His name was Jez. I met Jez on OkCupid. I was 28 and he was 42. We hit it off very quickly. After a few weeks of talking, I agreed to meet up with him at a restaurant close to my house. We sat and talked for a few hours before I invited him over to meet my husband. Things went very well too and they seemed to get along so Jez and I started dating. This guy too completely swept me off my feet. Jez was sweet and caring. He enthusiastically listened to every little thing on my mind, engaged and validated me. Over and over again, he absolutely revered me for my strength and wisdom. He practically worshipped me for all that I was and all that I was becoming. He showered me with gifts, flowers and random good deeds just to make me feel safe, wanted and cared for. I had never been in a relationship that felt quite like that. It was wonderful. It was as though we had been looking for each other for years. After the first few weeks, we had a meltdown over my polyamorous nature. He pulled the plug because he said that he was already falling for me and couldn't handle sharing me. I stood my ground and accepted this boundary and the fact that I would have to let him go. I left that night sad but confident that I had done the right thing for the both of us. That next week he sent me flowers and a card to my workplace begging for another chance and reassuring me that he would rather try than not and end up regretting it and even though it was scary he wanted to take his journey with me. So we continued dating and it was really wonderful. Long nights we spent awake talking, sharing, laughing, love making and planning. We went places and did things that I'd always wanted to do. Then in the deepest, most intimate moments, when we would just sit in silence, he would grip my hand to his face in solidarity and astonishment, asking where I've been all this time. Our time together was effortless. We fit together like puzzle pieces. By August of 2018, my marriage had ended, by no fault of Jez's, and by October my husband had moved out. I was on a lease at the time and knew that I couldn't afford the place on my own, so finding a roommate was essential. I had no support system to fall back on, nor did anyone else that I know need a place at the time, so Jez offered to move in. But even then I was hesitant. I mean, we'd only been together about four months and I knew everything always changes when you move in with a partner. But despite my hesitation, I agreed. I mean, he was wonderful to me. So how bad could it be? But boy, I was not prepared for the change that was to come. It was literally like night and day. Jez suddenly became a different person. He was extremely controlling, jealous and lazy. Nothing like the person that I thought I'd met. And the way that he treated me progressively got worse and worse. Hanging out with friends became a burden if not impossible because he would blow up my phone, guilting me about leaving him alone or not involving him in some way. Yet when I tried to, it was also treated as a burden and inconvenience as he would huff and puff his way through even the concept of leaving space for anyone but ourselves. In December of 2018, we attended my work Christmas party. I'd given him the option whether he wanted to go or not. It was really neither here nor there for me, especially because I had already learned that he really didn't do well if he felt pressured into social situations. But I opened the invitation to him because he had expressed to me over and over that it was important for him that he was involved in my social life. For the full month, he knew about it. He insisted that he wasn't going. I took it as him being introverted and didn't push the issue. I let him know that I would make sure that he felt welcomed if he decided to go but not to feel obligated. So I was surprised when he changed his mind at the last minute and insisted on going and even more stunned when we went and he actively acted as though he didn't want to be there. Everyone there was incredibly welcoming and included him in the festivities and conversation. However, he still practically grumbled the entire night about the whole thing mumbling insults and critiquing every little part of the party under his breath 
as though being there was absolutely awful to have to endure. No one really seemed to notice the low whispering insults and gripes. At one point, after a couple of glasses of wine, my direct manager leaned into Jez and started praising him. She and I were very close, therefore she was intimately familiar with what I had gone through with my ex-husband. I'm so, so happy she's with you, she bleated through wine happy. You have been absolutely transformative for her. It's so nice to see her finally happy and appreciated. Without missing a beat, Jez grimaced at the comment and quickly snapped back, you don't know me. I honestly didn't believe my ears. It was one of those moments where time sort of stops and you just know that you couldn't have heard that correctly. I sat, brewing on it for a minute, before another light-hearted interaction with Jez prompted him to suddenly snap at me through gritted teeth, stop it. This triggered me and I lost it. I pulled him outside and asked him what the problem was. I called out his behavior and told him that if he was going to act that way, then he could just leave. That if he didn't want to be there, he should have stayed home. He ended up sort of giving a half apology and we went back inside and finished the party. I remember the drive home that night, staring out of the dark window at nothing in particular, in worried silence. I might have messed up was my only thought through the entire drive. This all started out slow, of course, like waving me away or invalidating my experiences and ideas due to my age, that I was just dramatizing my experiences because I was young, etc. The man who, six months prior, had validated me, my trauma and experiences to the ends of the earth, now every time I started a story or tried to share anything, even trying to plan out meals for the week, he would openly show annoyance as though I was violating his time and attention. Before I knew it, he was snapping at me over every little thing. If I asked how his day was or talked about my day, he would aggressively shut it down. Why do you always ask me that? I don't want to talk shop at home. I really don't care about your work. It's work. Before I knew it, I couldn't even bring him a plate of breakfast without being snapped at. It was almost as though he was sort of, I don't know, like testing me. When Jez and I first started dating, he flat out refused to talk about most of all of his exes. He refused to name them or discuss any of the issues or lessons learned. They didn't matter, he claimed. They weren't in his life for a reason. It was the same reasoning he also used in reference to my more recent exes, talking about them, including my own ex-husband, may as well have become off limits. Anytime I brought up either of our exes, he would become incredibly agitated, belittling, and just overall very aggressive. I took this as both an age gap issue, as I have a tendency to dwell, as well as insecurity and a threat to the life that we were trying to build. However, after he moved in and this hot button topic had been established several times, he would bring up his exes and how they looked, telling me on more than one occasion that he would have never dated me back in the day and that I was lucky he lowered his standards. I didn't even really know what to say to this, to be honest. I would laugh it off and shove it in my back pocket, noted, I guess. He then started bringing up my looks and accusing me of catfishing him. I had stopped taking care of myself due to the isolation and had also put on some weight, so most of the clothes that I had once felt great in no longer fit. And since Jez had also been dishonest with me about his financial position, he was always needing extra money here and there, leaving me broke almost all of the time. A horrible tragedy happened that following summer while Jez and I were together. I received notice that a good friend I went to art school with actually deleted himself while tripping on LSD. Our whole class was devastated. He was, without contest, the best photographer of our class and one of the most kind-hearted individuals that I'd ever had the pleasure of knowing. Also, as someone who was familiar with LSD, I was rocked. Jez, however, was far from supportive. He pretty much immediately shrugged it off as, that's life, I guess that's what you get when you mess around with LSD. I was baffled at such an unsympathetic response. 
and even more, later, when Jez started to interrogate me about my relationship with this guy, asking the last time it was that I had even talked to this friend, you don't even know this guy anymore, who cares? I broke up with him the first time after he called me at work raging. I was busy, so I wasn't able to answer right away, but once I was finally able to answer, I was met with intense anger. It was storming and one of my dogs was having an anxiety attack due to the storm and separation anxiety. This wasn't the first time and he was well aware of what she needed in those moments. But why aren't you answering my calls? You answer when I call you. I don't care where you are. He went on for a few minutes calling me a, a terrible girlfriend and laying into me over my sudden distance and lack of communication while I was at work. At this point though, I was done and I just lost it. I tore into him over everything, especially causing problems for me at work. That being in my life is a privilege and that if he's going to wake up every day acting like he hates me, then I don't know what on earth he's even doing with me. I told him that I expected him to get his things and leave. He was always threatening to go back to his old roommates where there was still a room. I didn't want him there anymore when I got home and we could coordinate times for him to come and get the rest. He flatly refused, suddenly victimizing himself, claiming that he had nowhere to go. How dare you make me fall in love with you? How dare you take me to your father and then dump me? My manager and her husband ended up following me home that evening because she was actually concerned for my safety and had offered to let me stay with her for a few days. I will never forget the scene that I walked into though. It was like Theon Greyjoy begging for his life. My boss stood next to me, watching as this 42 year old man crawled on his knees before me, begging for mercy and communication. At one point, wrapping his arms around my legs, crying into them, I can't believe this is happening. She's the love of my life, you know that, he cried to my boss. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. This was the antithesis of the heartless person that I'd been spending my days with. I shook him off and went to the back of the house, gathering enough of my things to get me through the next few days, as well as any and all valuables that I could think of. It did take a few days, but after about a week, Jez started blowing up my phone, apology after apology. Suddenly, he was the man that I met again, full of humility and self-awareness. He acknowledged the awful way that he had treated me and sent me walls and walls of well thought out messages, psychoanalyzing his own behavior, where it comes from and the ways that he knows it needs to be changed. And so I took him back. Like a dumb and desperate girl, I took him back. It wasn't long into the second round though that he started to guilt me over the breakup. My panic had damaged his relationship with people in my life and he made sure that I knew that it was my responsibility to fix it. It wasn't long after this that my car ended up breaking down at a gas station close to home. There was a very nice couple in the vehicle next to me that came to my rescue and checked things out under my hood. The gentleman turned out to be a mechanic for a living so he had a pretty good theory about what could potentially be going on. By this time, I had already attempted to contact Jez to let him know what was going on and where I was. And it wasn't long until he got off work and so he told me to sit tight and he would be there shortly. Meanwhile, this sweet couple stayed put and kept me company while I waited. Jez barreled in about maybe 15 minutes later, completely ignoring the couple that had helped me. Touching base, the gentleman handed me a slip of paper with a name and a phone number on it reviewing what he thought was going on with my car before jez butted in cutting him off saying i said she's fine he snapped i could see the woman out of the corner of my eye slink away at this comment and get into the passenger seat of their car i could feel the sudden tension like maybe she's been there before the gentleman didn't move and shifted his attention to me as jez walked into the store i could see that he was clearly concerned uh, you okay? He asked in a low, almost whisper. You don't have to answer that, but if, if you need anything... He looked down at the number in my hand and nodded to it. Seriously. With that, he got into the driver's seat of his car and he drove away. 
I've thought about that couple countless times since that night. But everything went right back to the way that it was before, as though the initial breakup never even happened. The same eggshells, the same belittling, if anything it was worse in fact, because I had permanently damaged our relationship. If I had just not been so dramatic, if I didn't run away from everything, then maybe he wouldn't have to work so hard for respect in my life. One night, we got into an argument. I don't really even remember what it was about, but I had to be up early for work the next morning, so I paused the argument in order to get some sleep. When I went to lay down, I heard the TV on. I have a sound bar so the volume can get pretty loud. Jazz proceeded to turn the volume up and up and up, far past any volume that I ever pushed those same speakers to, even for parties. The very walls were reverberating with the sound of the TV at astronomical volumes. Jazz then started laughing hysterically. It was a, a laughter manic with anger as though something might be funny on TV, but he might also jump through a window right now. I remember laying in bed absolutely horrified at what was happening. I mean, I knew things had gotten bad, but this? Now, I was scared. I got out of bed and asked him to turn it down, to which he responded scoffing, I'll watch TV if I want to, and turned it up even louder. To be honest, it was at this point that it suddenly felt a bit like a horror movie. I started crying, begging him to please, please just let me sleep. And he started mocking me and calling me names for crying. Like, poor baby is crying again. That's your card, isn't it? Crying. This caused the fight to start again. And he started screaming at me. Followed me to my bedroom where he suddenly punched a door, not two inches from my head. His eyes were suddenly black too. And he looked me in the eye sending the clear, unsympathetic and hostile message that that was a warning and next time he wouldn't miss. My whole system had shut down at this point and I sunk to the floor in a panic attack. My ex-husband had issues with violence. Jez knew that. All of our rentals prior to that one had holes in walls and doors peppered throughout our unit due to my ex-husband's inability to handle his emotions but he never hit me or even came close to it. I crumbled to the ground feeling powerless, trapped and afraid. As my thoughts continued to race, he continued to berate and mock my panicked state. Most of our argument from that night was a blur to be honest, but ended abruptly once he threatened to put my social security number on the dark web. At this point, all that was left for me to do was fight. And I blacked out, went ballistic, screaming at him to get out. I felt rabid, dangerous, as I screamed like a banshee for him to leave my home. It was over, and I was ending it that second. I contacted my landlord and explained what had been going on. Jez would also end up contacting her, weaving his own tale that I was moving out and tried to have the lease transferred into his name. Luckily, since I was several steps ahead of him, my landlord didn't fall for it and contacted me immediately. She even personally came and changed my locks for me, gave me the personal contact of a police officer close by in case he showed up again, and took half off my rent for the next month. I am forever grateful to her for these simple acts of kindness that were above and beyond anything that I would ever expect from a landlord. It truly was a kind thing to do. But it took weeks for him to stop messaging me. The only reason why I didn't block him was out of fear that he would show up at my house. Although I had contacts for protection, I knew that I would rather get a daily apology video than have to deal with him on my doorstep. So they persisted. For a while. The same act from before. The love bombing, the promises, grasping at straws, trying to find the weak spot where I would let him back in. But this time I ignored it. It continued for weeks before he finally gave up. He bowed out gracefully, stating boldly that he will always love me. I left him on read. The illusion was destroyed at this point. It took me several years to pick up the pieces. If my divorce wasn't enough, then this definitely made me lose trust in myself. 
But to be honest, I still don't really understand what the end game was. In fact, in one of our last discussions, I asked him desperately what happened to the guy that I fell in love with. Jez looked me dead in the eye, smirked really creepily, and said, that guy doesn't exist. I told you what I had to tell you in order to get you away from your husband. You're just stupid and fell for it. So I will start by saying that even though these experiences have happened to me, I've always been a skeptic. My mother, who passed away nine years ago, was towards the end of her life a deep believer, as well as both of my sisters, though after my mother's passing, they have not spoken much on the subject unless asked about it, but they can verify three of the four stories that I'm about to lay out here as well. The first three of these stories take place in my childhood home in a trailer park that always seemed to have an odd vibe around it in general. I never found anything weird out about it, but we always had this theory like maybe an Indian burial ground or something was there, though I doubt it, but it was just a weird little rural area of southwest Michigan. The fourth story takes place at my father and stepmother's house, about eight miles north of the house the first three stories take place in but I'll start with what I feel is the least intense, moving to the ones that still spark great fear for me. So, story number one. I'll start this story at my father and stepmother's house, as it's pretty simple. I lived there in my early 20s and had the classic downstairs basement room. I was the black sheep of sorts, so it was only fitting to put me there anyway. We had a dog that always stayed with me, especially when family was doing whatever. This happened multiple times, but I'll share the last time that I remember this happening. So, I'm sitting downstairs hanging out, YouTubing or whatever I was doing, when my dog, like he normally does when people come home, starts going absolutely nuts, barking and pacing for me to let him upstairs so that he can greet whoever he believes came through the door, and as I get out of my chair to let him do so... I hear the classic footsteps of what I believe is my little brother, as they're too fast to be my mother or stepmom. I hear them go all the way to the back, back end of the house and stay there, so I let the dog out. I follow suit, thinking maybe my folks need help grabbing something they may have brought home. I get upstairs. Nothing at all. The lights are off. Nobody's home. The dog even seems to be thinking, what the heck? Now, at this point, this is the fourth or fifth time that this has happened in the few years that I'd been living there, mostly starting in the latter part of those years. So this time, I felt ballsy about it. I decided like an idiot to just ask if anybody was there. There was no answer. So I go further into the house facing the hallway, leading to the back of the house to a couple of bedrooms. I put myself in a bathroom so that when I yell at it, I won't see down the hallway when it comes to kill me. But I get in the bathroom and like an idiot, I somewhat angrily yelled, who is in my house? And at this point, I hear something fall in the back bathroom between the two bedrooms. I poke my head out to verify that nobody is there. I check the garage, nobody's there either. And then went back downstairs where... I waited for people to actually come home. It was a, a really eerie evening for me and, I don't know, the house just didn't feel right that day. So the second story, this is where to me, these things started to amp up a bit and they really get a bit freaky. Just something about this trailer park and the trailer that I lived in. This was after living in the same trailer with my mum who my dad then took over after their divorce and was now living there with my stepmom. So I remember that this was maybe 2006, I think. I was probably 13 or so and at the time loved being up late as it was summer vacation from school. And this summer, I liked smoking with my sister late at night in the backyard with the neighbor boy. And this night, we weren't smoking anything illicit, just us three hanging out smoking cigarettes and talking. For some reason or another, my sister takes her phone out and, I kid you not, for some reason starts recording an audio file. 
This, I think, was on one of those unbreakable Nokia phones back in the day, and the quality is really terrible on these things, but it was recording nonetheless. And not for anything paranormal, but thinking about it now, I don't remember for the life of me what she was trying to record. But the point is, is that she was recording all three of us standing there, when all of a sudden, about two feet to my right, we all hear the most unsettling, blood-curdling, just nasty woman scream for a solid two seconds immediately being like what the heck was that even getting so worked up that we called the police who didn't find anything after showing up 20 minutes later but the best part my sister the next day realized that she had recorded this audio file naturally she goes into her phone to review it realizing that she had never thought to stop the recording but there it was on her phone so we listen back to it, everything's normal, you can hear us talking right up until you then hear this scream, which when this happens in the recording, you hear us go sort of quiet, then a very sort of static type silence, and then you hear us all go, what was that? And then the recording cuts off a few seconds later. Back then too, I always said it must have been a fox, but with how loud it was and how close it was, there was no fox anywhere near us, so that explanation just didn't make much sense. I must admit that I have a bit of a hard time with these two stories as they're the only two that have sort of like visual or auditory experiences and to me are the absolute hardest to explain, which kind of leaves me feeling out of my wits even thinking about them, let alone about sharing them here, but anyway, I digress. So the third story, to start, my mum was always a bit of a night owl, no exception even when we lived with her until 2005, and I think that this was somewhere around 2002 or 2003. But the bedroom that I was in was right next to where the kitchen was. You could in fact see right out, into, but you couldn't really see the table where we sat from here as the angle cut off that view, but it would have been to the right of the bedroom door looking out. Now, I remember waking up at about 3 or 4 in the morning or so and looking out and seeing the dining room light on and hearing my mum using a sewing machine at the table. So I yelled for her to come in here. I hear the machine stop and she comes to the doorway. And what I remember was just the most menacing, horrifying, mean look on her face as she just stood there staring right at me. No words, no nothing just this look like why are you talking to me right now I don't really remember at this point if I said or did anything while she stood there doing this but just as quick as she was standing there she just as quickly still with no words at all turned first her head away then her body followed suit and then she just walked away this as most would assume is very much unlike most anyone's mum but I very much remember as soon as she was out of sight, I started screaming and crying, and yet again I hear her getting up from her sewing machine, this time a little more frantic, she comes in asking what's wrong, with the classic mum calming down horrified kid going on. So I told her what I had literally just seen, and she said very plainly that she had not just been in here, and that she had been sewing the whole time, and... It is not like my mum to just come in and stare at me down menacingly like that, especially at three in the morning to scare me. So, to be honest, I believed her. Now, the fourth story is my least favourite of these. I don't even really like thinking about this one, but it's the one that I wanted to bring here most as I just want to know what other people may think about this. So again... Much like the last story, it's 3 or 4 in the morning, I'm in the same exact bedroom, bottom bunk, sister is on the top bunk, this time everybody is asleep, all the lights in the house are off and it's pretty quiet, when suddenly I hear what I believe is a slightly heavy load in our dryer or maybe the washer washing a little off balance or something. This sound wakes me all the way up because it just seems a bit weird. So I roll over to get comfy and I open my eyes a bit. As I'm looking around, I see what is some movement toward the kitchen. 
Now, again, you can see from this room out into the kitchen, but not the dining area. What you saw from my perspective is the island in the kitchen where the sink was, and you could see a little far sort of side off of our living room behind that. But I'm just kind of scanning the kitchen listening to this weird sound that I keep hearing. And that was when I see it. I can't say that it was standing as I saw no legs but standing or stood behind the island but extremely tall is this very plain almost 2D looking man. All white, no features whatsoever, no face, no nothing. As you look down his body, it appeared to be more faint too, but still a definite white figure or person just stood there. To be honest too, at first I'm thinking that there must be headlights hitting the window from a car outside or something, but then I realize that this thing has sort of like a cowboy type hat on. And not only that, it seems like it's taking its hat off and like tipping its hat in my direction. Like... It's tipping its hat at me almost. Now, at this point, I'm genuinely trying to make sure that I'm 100% awake. And as far as I could tell, I was. So, I go back to looking because naturally I just cannot look away now. And it just sort of repeats the same exact movements over and over again. Pulls the hat down, puts it back on, pulls it down, then back on. All the while, this weird sound is still happening... So I'm trying to justify it in my mind by thinking somehow the neighbor's kid is playing a prank on me and somehow is outside the window that's a bit behind this thing using some sort of a puppet or something. But then I realize how stupid a thought that this is. And that was the moment that I started screaming. My sister wakes up and asks what's going on. I tell her exactly what I see and I ask her if she sees it too. Oddly, no. She doesn't see it at all. This makes me scream even more, though. This time waking up my mum, who, as she comes into the kitchen, turns on the light. And as soon as she did that, it just disappeared. Though, I still hear the strange sound, so I ask my mum what the sound is and if the washer is going. And she goes and looks and neither machine is running. And for whatever reason, this woman takes one look at me feels my head to see if I have a fever, which I didn't, and then tells me that I have a fever and that's why I'm seeing stuff like that. So I try and calm myself. She leaves the room and turns the kitchen light off again. And sure enough, there is this guy again, still tipping that hat over and over. Eventually, I just convinced myself, I guess, that I was having a fever illusion or something. I managed to roll over and I fell asleep somehow afterward. I still mention this story to my sister and she still very vividly remembers every bit of it, the way that she saw it anyway. Years later too, and after some study on this subject, I have always said that it was the Hat Man, but the thing is is that what I've read and heard on the Hat Man is nothing like this. My mother later also recounted this story and later told me that though she didn't see or hear what I did, she only told me that I had a fever and stuff to calm me down and she knew that it wasn't a fever causing it. So I guess the question is, what did I see that night? When I was a preteen, early teen, I had reoccurring nightmares involving my maternal grandparents. Their residence would change or be different in many of my dreams, but there would always be this dark room with an evil presence inside of it, usually on an upper floor. I would usually be too frightened to go inside, but the few times that I was brave enough to enter, there would only be darkness, that malevolent feeling, and sometimes there would be a mirror of all things. In one particular dream, my family on my mum's side was downstairs talking and enjoying themselves while I happened to be exploring in the evil room upstairs. I looked into the mirror and I saw the reflection of a girl running past me. When I ran downstairs to tell them what I had just saw, everyone and everything just became completely dead silent. They were all just sort of looking at me without saying a word 
until my mum came up to me, placed a hand on my shoulder and said, that girl represents the curse of my past. I rarely had any more of those dreams after that one. Now, some interesting, albeit creepy, real life facts to consider. After my mum's parents died, my mum, aunts and myself cleaned up their house and I happened to find that exact same mirror underneath a bed in that room that when I was a lot younger and my grandfather was still alive, he would always yell and call me out of it for some reason. I always felt some kind of, I don't know, dark presence in parts of that house and their backyard shack as well. My grandfather was a, a Shriner Freemason and according to my mum, he was very abusive towards her when she was young. She didn't really like to talk about it much though. Also, when my mum and her two sisters were young, they messed around with a Ouija board once. Hopefully just once, although it only takes one time apparently. There's a lot of strange things involving myself and my family and I just provide this to paint a bit of a picture. So, what I saw when I was younger was this. I saw pale colored, non-human creatures in my room once when I was really young. I remember, well, hallucinating is probably the best term for it, and crawling to the door. Then I heard my mother call for me from across the house, and I had enough willpower to go to get to her, and as soon as I exited my room, everything went pitch black for a couple of minutes. My vision was mostly gone, my awareness was screwed up, but both came back to me soon after feeling my way down the hallway into my mum's direction. I led her back to my room, but whoever or whatever was there was gone without a trace. Before she died in 2010, she told me that she remembered that occurrence, and for some reason, she was the one to use the word creatures, which always stuck out to me. Did she see something? I'm fairly certain that I'm not being told everything, and I just know deep down that whatever I saw was real. Two friends and I briefly witnessed a V-shaped UFO in Tulsa, Oklahoma as well one night, back in April of 2009. It was absolutely huge, seemingly cloaked, besides the dim lights, transparent or semi-transparent, slow moving and completely silent. So far, the only unidentified craft I've seen to my knowledge. On a related note too, one of my paternal uncles was in the military. He actively researched UFOs for unknown reasons. He's very secretive about such things and has at least one or two books about them. So my family seems to have a, a history with this, which obviously with what I saw is definitely a bit strange. This incident happened years ago, so I'm sorry if some information is a bit vague, but I'm just sharing what I can remember. So one day in the summer of 2017, it was a gloomy day at the start of our walk, but that's not relevant. Me and my bestie had decided to go for a hike. This time we decided to take the trail, even though we usually just walked wherever we wanted. But as we got to the bench, which was just over halfway up, we took a break. A young girl and her dog were jogging down the mountain. There was really nothing out of the ordinary, so we assumed that it was safe to go to the top. Once we got to the last turn before the top, I all of a sudden just got a, a really uneasy feeling. We continued, but near the top, there was a slope with lots of rocks and rubble, and I could see three or four men at the top conversing behind a bush of some sort. So I stopped dead in my tracks and I then heard one of the men say frantically, hide the body, hide the body bag. He said it just loud enough that me and my bestie knew what he had just said. My bestie took a couple of steps forward to see if it was just some teens messing with us, but it was a small group of men with a body bag. I never saw the bag, the body or any of the men's faces. Me and my bestie just said quietly, what do we do? Then we gave each other the get me the heck out of here look and we just booked it. None of the men followed us thankfully and we made it down the mountain safely. 
We ended up making a police report because my bestie saw the bag, the men, and also some old blood on the bag too. Despite the local police not believing us, they scraped them out and they originally didn't believe us and found nothing, but shortly after this encounter, a news report came out about an Australian guy that went missing and his remains were found in my hometown. It was then that the pieces started to click. I personally believe that the man was killed way before they brought his body to the mountain to dispose of it. I mean, if you really think about it, they probably wanted the body to be found if they were stupid enough to ditch it on a public mountain with a hiking trail of all places. Of course, in the news report, they never said me and my bestie found the body because who would believe two teenagers, right? Plus, a search team had found the remains of the poor guy, so of course they're going to get all the credit. I still don't know to this day why this happened, but all I can say is that I'd never lie about witnessing something like this. It was truly messed up. So I don't know a ton about the history of my childhood home, but I know that it was old and one of the creepiest places that I've ever lived. It was a four-story house, fancy right, with lots of dark spaces and long stairways. Basically, it was really big. There wasn't a moment in that house that I felt like I was truly alone too, and there wasn't a hallway that felt truly empty. I was just barely out of toddlerhood when I started to develop severe anxiety. I was afraid to do anything alone. I was always checking behind me, sleeping with my head under the covers, seeing things, hearing things, you name it. I'm almost 100% sure that there was something paranormal making me feel this way at that time. And I wasn't the only one seeing and hearing things though too. My older brother shared a room with me and he always slept on the top bunk. His bed was maybe a foot away from the ceiling and the attic was right above us. And he told me that some nights he would hear adult footsteps right above his head just circling the attic. But it gets weirder still. He's told me that at one point he woke up next to a, a shadowy figure just lying in the bed with him. He claims the figure had two white specks for eyes and that it wasn't acting malicious, just sort of lying there silently. This might have been some kind of sleep paralysis hallucination, we know that, but considering the other events, I wouldn't be surprised if it was something else. And now, onto the main event, the playroom. That room was the creepiest thing in the house, and I get shivers just thinking about it. It sat at the end of a long hallway on the top floor, just below the attic. My room was down the hall from it, and it was always pitch black. I remember staying up at night staring at it, just in case something moved. I often couldn't take my eyes away in fear of something appearing if I did. Somehow, every time that I looked at that doorway, the door was wide open, and the door wasn't weak either. It worked perfectly fine and wouldn't open unless you turn the knob. I'd ask my dad to close it before I went to bed and it would stay closed for a bit until all of a sudden it would just slide open again. Now, I'm not a door specialist by any means, but it was arguably very creepy. But there's more to this as well. Now that we're older and out of that house, me and my brother found out that we shared a, a terrifying experience once. We both saw something incredibly creepy in the same place. I remember it vaguely. It was a, a small, neutral, glowing white face in the playroom. It looked a little bit like a, a kid from my memory, but it had no body, just a, a pure white face in the dark. It was around my height and his eyes were kind of just, well, not there really. I don't remember much, but what I do remember is that it was the single most terrifying thing that I'd been through in that place. I don't know if I hallucinated or what, but I know that it felt incredibly real at the time. Maybe it was just a dream or something because all I remember is seeing that face, getting scared and running back to my bed. I don't think that I screamed, but 
I just don't really remember too much. I kind of, I don't know, like, love hate thinking about it because it just makes my hair stand on edge. Anyway, thanks to that house, I have now been diagnosed with anxiety. I'm taking medication for it and I'm alright, but I thought that that was worth noting. I could go on as well about other things, but those were definitely the things that stand out the most. So, a couple of weeks ago, I was headed out to my family cemetery about five miles outside of town. I hadn't been out there since a couple of days after Christmas, right after I had learned that my dad had finally lost his battle with lung cancer. I've spent a lot of time at that cemetery in the last few years. I like to go out there and do audio recordings, and just for the fact that it's so peaceful out there. And well, it used to be anyway. You see, I've had some really bad experiences out there in the last couple of years, have gotten some really nasty EVPs, and it turned into a very dark place at night, but that's a story for another time. Now, when I go out there, I always stop at a little country church about a mile down the road. The reason for this is because the church used to belong to my great-grandfather and my great-uncle, both of whom preach there, and I go there and ask for their protection and guidance before going to the cemetery, but on this night, I change my pattern for some reason. Instead of going to the church first, I drove on past the cemetery about maybe a half mile to some property that my aunt and uncle own. There's a small creek that runs along the road, and just before you get to the creek is where my life started out at, the old homestead. Now, at the bottom of the hill, the creek sort of crosses under the road and makes a sharp turn to continue following the road. In that turn is what used to be a pretty deep hole. My mum and dad grew up right down the road from there, and all my family used to swim in that hole and fish. It's been a very long time since my parents and my uncle and even me have swam there. As a matter of fact, over the years that hole is filled in and sort of is no more just a shallow bend in the creek. But back in the day, one of my uncle's high school friends drowned there. My uncle also drowned there, but they were able to revive him, thank God. So, anyway, when I arrived there, I backed my truck into the drive. I was barely off the roadway and left my headlights on and the motor running. I was only going to be there for maybe a minute. I started to record a video with my iPhone and was describing why I was going to the cemetery. Now, during all of this, at one point, I could have sworn that I saw something pop up from the creek and then go back down really quickly. However, I tried to ignore it and kept going on with my video. After a minute or so, it happened again though. I didn't miss a beat though and I kept on filming, but noted that it appeared to be a figure of human nature, but sort of grayish white, kind of skinny, but I didn't see its face. Once again, I kept right on going, trying to ignore what I had seen, and then it happened a third time, but this time it looked more gray than white, and there was no face, and at that moment, the feeling of something dark, unfriendly, and mad that I was there washed over me all of a sudden, and every hair on my body stood straight on end. I start saying, this isn't good repeatedly, and then I got the feeling that something aggressive and really mad was approaching very quickly. It's hard to describe, but that's the feeling that I got, and at that, I tried to get out of there as quickly as I could, but it wasn't quick enough. I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but... If anyone is, then have you ever got what some call spirit jumped? It's where a spirit or entity jumps into your body. It's brief most of the time, but not brief enough. Your body goes into survival mode. Adrenaline dumps, but not like a normal adrenaline dump. This is like 10 times worse. It may also feel like your breath is sort of sucked right out of your lungs, and it's a struggle to breathe in any air. It's really scary when it happens, but... You also feel like something evil has reached into your body and grabbed your soul all of a sudden. It's a very demanding warning to get the heck away and that they mean business. 
So when I pulled out of there, I headed straight up the road to the church, but before I could get there, I heard a very ominous growl over my left shoulder and got hit a second time. This was much worse than the first time too. I became very vocal and demanded that it get away and get out of my truck, but whatever it was, it must have stayed there until I reached the church. But when I pulled in, I called upon my great-grandfather for help. Then I was hit a third time. It was brief, but the point was gotten across to me. All of a sudden, I could then feel everything lighten up, as they say. The hairs went down, and I became relaxed fairly quickly. I left the church soon after, and I went back home where I had my daughter bring out my Bible, and I didn't go inside until I was certain that whatever it was had left me. The next evening, I went to the family cemetery, stopping at the church first, of course. I used the Necrophonic app, which I use quite a bit from time to time. I didn't even ask about the night before, but I was told that there was evil at the creek. Stay away from the water. They call it dark water. I had never in almost three years of using that app ever gotten those responses or any mentions of water or dark water. And no, I was not under the influence of anything. I take no medications and other than some post-traumatic stress disorder, I have no mental health issues. Nothing that would cause this at least. This particular area is pretty rural. The area had a lot of Native American activity and is within 300 feet of a known burial ground as well as another cemetery that has long been forgotten. As a kid, the woods around this area always seemed to have a dark side. We always felt watched when we were playing in the woods around there. There is also a piece of property within maybe a quarter mile that was rumored as apparently being owned by a witch. So I've had many things happen to me in my life. I've seen a full body shadow apparition which turned out to be the so called hat man which I discovered by accident in another place. I've seen objects move, sometimes two objects at the same time that are about 10 feet apart. I've had my locked door open and close on its own which requires another whole story to explain because there's a lot of details to it. I've captured over a dozen Class A EVPs, some of which are the clearest you'll ever hear. I've recorded an EVP of a person who told me his full name to find out that he wasn't even dead yet, but died two days later after the EVP. I've recorded spirit box sessions and I understand the doubt in all this, but it works. I have two sessions that there's just no denying that it answered directly. I've had things thrown at me, been laughed at sarcastically by a voice. I'll post separate stories about all these experiences at some point and go into great detail. But what I'm getting at is that none of these things actually scared me. I even would say out loud the names of whatever these things were and that they don't scare me. There's only one incident though that actually did scare me. You see, at one point... Out of the blue, I woke up out of a trance in front of my stove with the burner on and a knife with a plastic handle in the frying pan with the handle melting. I had no idea what happened. My girlfriend told me that I called her and apparently wasn't making any sense. I had pieces of food in the freezer with knife slashes all over them. And the craziest thing of all is that I had a room air cleaner balancing perfectly upside down in the bedroom which is impossible to do. In fact, I tried it well over a dozen times, trying to stand it upside down, but it doesn't have the top surface where it's possible, so I still have no idea how that happened. But what I'm getting at here is that I had no control over myself for, I would guess, maybe half an hour. And something happened... I started thinking about how some murderers said that they blacked out when savagely stabbing someone or how someone who everyone thought was completely normal just lost it and they commit mass murders for just no reason. And now I have to wonder if maybe there's some truth to it and maybe true evil does exist because I have a feeling that maybe I was possessed. 
And what if my mother or somebody else that I love was in that house with me that day? What would I have done? Would I have just been limited to the few spaces and the few weird things that I had done? Or would something much worse have happened? This was about 12 years ago on a September day. It was time for me to renew my license, so me, my wife and two sons, who were one and two years old, set out to drive a few towns over, about 45 minutes away, and renew my license. It was a crispy fall day. I still remember how beautiful it was. We left home at about 8am or so because we knew that we would be back home by 11 and have some time with the babies before our daughter got off the bus at 2.40pm. We had plenty of time. We arrived at the DMV a few minutes after 9. My wife stayed with the kids while I ran into the DMV. I got my license and walked about 10 minutes till 10. As I walked to the car, I saw my wife standing outside smoking and our babies were asleep. We got in the car to come home and that's where things got very strange. You see, as we pull out of the plaza and onto the off-ramp... I began to feel very weird. I felt a, I don't know, like a vibration inside of me. I'm not talking about a vibration like driving on the rumble strip or sitting on a washer or something. I'm talking about it felt like the cells inside of my body were vibrating at a, a sort of subatomic level. I've never felt that before, but I began to wonder if I was having a medical emergency or something. As I looked over at my wife as we drove down the off-ramp, we both sort of faded into the black. Next thing I know, I'm watching those white painted divider strips in the middle of the highway that separate the lanes, each one passing by very quickly, and I'm watching, thinking how interesting this is, just one after another. I'm in some kind of a trance or daze or something. It felt very strange. I wasn't in control of myself though, but then I looked over at my wife and she was leaned all the way forward in her seat, close to the windshield, seat belt extended all the way, her eyes were wide open, and her mouth was gaped open too. I've never seen her do that before, nor since then, and at the same time I thought that it was very strange. Then I go back to watching those white lines on the highway, then it's as if I start fading back in. I sort of become aware of my hands on the steering wheel once again. I look back over at my wife and she closes her mouth and leans back in her seat. It seems that we must have come to at the same time. Then it was as if I was released and given full control and I was now fully aware and I said, what the heck is going on? Where are we? My wife is looking around puzzled. She checks the babies and they're still asleep. I'm trying to figure out where we are, but there's just no way because... We're now getting ready to drop into the capital city. This isn't even the way that we were traveling. I immediately pull off the highway and we start discussing what just happened. I asked my wife what the last thing she remembered was. And she said coming off the ramp right after we left the DMV. I said me too and I told her about the vibrations that I felt and how I just sort of faded to black. We were stumped, a little panicked obviously. But I then see the clock and it's 2pm. There's just no way. I asked where four hours went and we're so far out of our way that just none of this made any sense. My wife had to call my parents and have them pick up our daughter off the bus. My mum asked if everything was okay and my wife said that we're all okay but no and that we would explain when we got there. At this point, it was closer for us to drive through the capital city and come around the back way home. We were about an hour and 45 minutes from home and as we drove home, I kept trying to rationalize everything. I would say a few words and then stop. She was doing the same thing. We finally got home. I told my mum and dad what had happened and they know that we aren't liars or anything and they didn't really know what to say. But this happened. And to this day, I don't know what it was. I don't want to dox myself or anything, but this also happened where a very famous UFO or alien monster thing happened many years ago. 
In any case though, about two months later, we were in bed asleep and I woke up all of a sudden. There was a dull blue light in our bedroom in the front of the windows. It was about the size of a basketball and I laid there looking at it. I could see that it was three dimensional too. I dug my elbow into my wife's side and said, look, we watched for a couple of minutes, then it just seemed to turn off. I got up and tried to debunk what it was, but there's nothing that could have created that effect. Is it connected? I don't know, but not long after this, I noticed a scar on my right wrist. It's a perfect triangle-shaped scar about the size of a pea, I would guess. Have no idea where that could have come from. My wife checked herself, but didn't find anything out of the ordinary on her. Okay, so we live in a very touristy sort of lake town. We were out and about, and I saw a tourist magazine on the counter of a local gas station. Later, when I'm home, I'm sitting in my chair just thumbing through it. And that's when I come across an account that someone had sent into this tourist magazine. And my jaw hit the floor. This lady said that her and her husband had come to our lake on vacation and had a really strange occurrence. She said that they were in a small canoe going across the lake when all of a sudden they just blacked out or something and then woke up sitting in the canoe in a dry drainage ditch beside the lake. If I remember right, she said that they were 15 to 20 feet from the lake water. They didn't understand how they ended up there and they were really scared. They had to carry their canoe back to the water and paddle away. That's how far away they were. And she said that they packed up camp, left quickly, and that they were never going to come back here. This took place a couple of years ago now. I was in middle school at the time. Myself, my sister, and my mum were both on our front porch, unlocking the door after coming home from school. We noticed something was off right away because our alarms didn't go off and my mum always made a point to set the alarm before we leave the house. Although that was weird and we all noticed and commented about it, it was very possible that we just forgot to set it. And because of that possibility, we just ignored it and we moved on. As we entered the house and were beginning to set our backpacks and other stuff down, I heard a drawer close in my bedroom I thought that I was just hearing things, so I looked at my mum and was about to ask her if she heard something. My mum looked at me at the same time, and her look of horror was enough for me to realise that she heard the same thing. My sister didn't seem to notice because she had her earphones in, but that sound and the fact that the alarm was off was enough for my mum to decide to get us out of there. She loudly said, I want to show you guys something in the backyard because she didn't want anyone in the house to know that we heard them and that's why we were leaving the house. My sister looked confused but I knew exactly what my mum just said and why she said it. As we entered the backyard and shut the door behind us, we sped walked towards the alley behind our house. The only thing that separated us from it was a wooden fence. Once we reached that wooden fence, we opened the gate and began to exit into the alleyway. I was the last to exit through the gate, and before I shut the gate, I looked at the house one last time, and to my horror, I saw, standing there, someone looking at me through our curtains. We called the police, and unfortunately, they didn't find anyone, and also, weirdly enough, nothing was stolen. I never told anyone about what I saw, but I'll never forget that day. And it always sits really poorly with me that whoever was in there wasn't interested in our stuff. This happened when I was about 12. I still remember it vividly as I've told the story many times since. So I figured that I'd share it here with all of you. I was staying with my grandparents and aunt in Bryan, Texas... She's always been more like a cousin to me because she's one year younger than me. My dad was with us the first night, but he had to head off to do some work or something and left me with the grandparents for the remainder of the stay. I was staying in the room where my grandparents were caring for my since-departed great-grandmother since it was the only free room in the house. The couple nights leading up to the incident, 
there was really nothing out of the ordinary too. Then on the third night, I went to bed like usual and everything was fine. I always left the door sort of cracked open a bit, so it was also cracked on this specific night. But the first thing that I remember that startled me was the old rotary phone making a noise out of nowhere. These phones were before my time, so I don't know exactly how they work, but it made this really long, continuous sort of beeping noise for what felt like about two or three minutes before it stopped. Kind of freaked out. I didn't really think much of it, to be honest. I mean, maybe it was malfunctioning. It eventually stopped on its own, too, which made me feel better. But the thing that really scared me was shortly after the beep stopped, I then noticed a shadow outside of the cracked door, which appeared to be someone walking by, which didn't startle me at first, but as it went by, the door slammed really hard. My scared 12-year-old self instantly pulled the blankets over my head and I was scared but eventually I must have fallen asleep because all I remember is waking up the next morning. The next morning after I woke up I saw my aunt and she also seemed terrified. I asked her what was wrong and she asked me if I was walking around last night. I said no and she seemed really scared, so I asked why she asked me. She said that she was awake in her bed late at night and heard something making noise. She then said that she stared at her door and it opened. And a tall black figure made its way into her room. Her bed was positioned in such a way that there was a small gap between the bed and the wall. And she told me that she saw the figure got scared and basically rolled herself and her blanket over into the gap between her bed and the wall and stayed there all night out of fear. Obviously, this freaked me out a bit too, but now we both thought that maybe it was her dad walking around at night. I also often forget to mention too, but the house also had a home security system that made a very loud beep every time a door or window was opened so neither of us thought that it would be a home invasion or anything like that. But then, not even five minutes later, both her parents wake up and come out of their room and asked us if we were walking around last night because they heard lots of noise. Neither me nor my aunt have really said anything about it to each other since then, but I do think that we both came to the same realization that there was something odd going on in the house that night. So, this just happened last night. My boyfriend, our husky, and I embarked upon our long holiday road trip to see our families earlier today. 14 hours of this trip takes place on a major US interstate highway. We were looking for places to make our last gas stop and found a place just off the highway. We pulled off and into the desolate gas station and immediately were greeted by a fairly large, somewhat sketchy man taking not-so-subtle glances in our direction. But we were both sort of joking that maybe we chose the wrong gas station, and boy, we did. My boyfriend suggested that while he pumped the gas and run to the restroom that I take our dog and let him stretch his legs. But being a city girl, I know to always carry my mace and phone, especially at night, and so... We diverged as I started to make my way towards the, the ill-lit side of the gas station and my boyfriend to the restroom. I made it not even 30 feet from my car and was approached by a, a small chihuahua sort of mutt with a collar who happily greeted our husky. I looked around for an owner while the two dogs got to know one another and continued to walk to a patch of grass with our new follower in tow. My first instinct was to help the dog and find the owner but... In the back of my mind, something just felt very off to be honest. It felt off since the moment that we pulled in in fact. I immediately called my boyfriend and told him that I had found a dog and said, hey I found a dog but something is weird. He immediately abandoned his bathroom break and came out to meet me. While I'm standing with that dog and this dog who came seemingly out of nowhere, I felt eyes on me from the employees working outside. My boyfriend expressed his concern about the dog being loose so close to a major highway and further looked around for its possible owner. 
He approached one of the employees who was changing our trash liners right next to our car for some time now. He asked the employee if he had any idea whose dog this was. In perfect English, he replied, I don't speak English, and anxiously turned around to only continue to go through the motions of changing out a trash liner that he'd been standing at this whole time. He then continued to watch us chase around this dog until the dog led us behind the store or gas station. With my boyfriend five feet behind me, I followed the dog to the back of the store. And behind the store, a ten or so big rig truck sat largely in darkness, resting for the night. Cardboard boxes and broken wood pallets covered the dirt. A large man in a gas station uniform greeted me, staring through a glass door. With my boyfriend out of view, I bent down to check the dog's tag as the man continued to stare. My boyfriend approached, and that's when the man behind the glass door's demeanor completely changed. Almost dejectedly, he opened the glass door. I quickly asked, Do you know whose dog this is? Nervously, he fumbled his words and replied, Yeah, uh, that's my our dog. Well, we both exhaled and exchanged a look as if to say something about that was really weird. We made our way back to the car and my boyfriend remembered that he still had to use the bathroom, so I settled back into our locked car and when my boyfriend got back to the car, he told me the same man that we talked to at the back of the store followed him to the bathroom and stood behind him just watching. I think that's when we realized just how creepy and surreal the last 15 minutes had been. As we drove away, we discussed the strange and creepy series of events, how the whole thing felt staged or set up. I mean, why did the employee act like he didn't know the dog when it belonged to his co-worker? We immediately googled the small town we had stopped in and discovered that apparently it has been a hotspot for human trafficking and in recent months as much as 60 people had been arrested. Was this just a string of eerie coincidences or was there something way more sinister going on here? I've thought my house has been haunted for a long time now, but recently it's been getting to me a lot more. I've had a, a few experiences. Normally they'd be pretty big ones, but always happened few and far between. My family lives on an old farm, 15 and a half acres, pretty big with forests and a very nice place with three main barns. One is the red barn and we built half of it into an actual house and still use part of it for sheep. It's the newest barn on the area. The black barn is very old and worn down. But we keep extra wood and stuff in there. And lastly, there's the house barn. The house barn is the oldest, over 500 years old I think, and when it was built it used absolutely no nails. So, the first encounter I had a few years ago... It was pretty late and I was about to go to sleep from watching a movie, I think. I looked over onto the other couch across from me for the controller and just sort of watched it turn from being horizontal to vertical and face me. It moved incredibly slowly and just... It was really odd. Nothing I can really think of that was a large event happened before what I think is the biggest one that I've had but I'd been trying to sleep, only my mum was home and I knew that she hadn't left her room when I hear someone try to open my door, like they'd been rattling with the doorknob. My door wasn't shut properly or locked and was easily able to be pushed open. Then, in my mum's voice and perfectly monotone, I hear, help, help me. That's what really got to me too and suddenly it just stopped. I hear heavy footsteps walk around, lights turn on after I know that I'd left them off. The dogs began barking at nothing and getting bad vibes or suddenly getting super cold in one area. With the history of our farm, I'd have to assume that maybe it's an Amish spirit who died working on the barn or something. But I also have neighbours just down our old gravel road who I happen to be friends with one of the kids there. And their older sister is apparently an occultist and has done many spells in their house. And recently, she apparently let something loose. My main worry is that this could be evil or 
a type of mimic as it seems to be attached to my mum who's heard her name be called throughout the house when she's alone or in bed and no one who lives at my house calls her by her name well, we just say mum obviously I've heard many coyotes almost right outside of my window too yet the dogs never bark at that which makes me think they might be scared of it I don't know but I would like to figure it out and see if there's even one spirit here or any at all I'm pretty paranoid about these sort of things and don't want anything to happen and would be very open to suggestions as to how to move forward from here. So every morning I drive over to Stone Mountain from Atlanta for a jog around the five mile loop as a bit of a warm up. Then I would sprint up the mountain once or twice to finish off. There was only one rocky part of the mountain cleared for going up and down, and it was the less steep side of the mountain, near the main entrance that is. That time in the morning there was either nobody else or there was maybe like one other person. One morning, I'd been on the loop and was about a mile or two in, and this was one loop with the mountain in the middle, and there was no shortcut or alternate way back, and a white van with no windows drives by kind of slow. I took note of that, of course, but keep going as it was my only option. A while later, the van comes back around from behind again and I started to get seriously alerted because I hadn't seen anybody else out there at that point and I was pretty well out in the middle of nowhere. The van drives past and disappears around the curve, but then comes around towards me even slower I was good and scared at that point and started to run a good bit faster and tried to make myself look tough and menacing as I ran. The van kept going past without stopping so I tried to talk myself into just uh, it being a maintenance worker or something and thanked my lucky stars that everything was okay. Well, it wasn't okay and uh, about a minute later the van had turned around and came back up behind me again and pulled up just ahead of me and stopped as I was running towards it. I was trying to quickly figure out what the heck to do and had to come to a stop when I saw the back doors of the van fly open towards me. I knew that I couldn't outrun a van in either direction so I immediately decided my only option was to sprint up the mountain as fast as I could and hope to outrun them. But being so used to running up the mountain daily and seeing how easily I blew past other people not used to going up it every day, I figured that I had a good shot at outrunning just about anybody. So I busted my butt up the rocky, woody, thick brushed mountain as fast as I could. This person took after me but I did not look back once. It was really hard, there was no clear path and I had to dodge stuff and run in jagged directions to get away. I heard him behind me for what seemed like about maybe a minute and then I, I didn't hear anything after that. I still didn't look back, just kept busting upwards as fast as I could. I got to the top, checked my scrapes and caught my breath before rushing back down the cleared path and back to my car. I never saw anyone else or the van after that, although I was scared to death and on high alert until I got into my car. There was a welcome centre down near the entrance but at that time it just wasn't open. This was before cell phones as well so I got in my car as fast as I could and I headed back home feeling so lucky and fortunate that I was able to get away that day. I didn't go back there in the mornings anymore after that and didn't go back for a while afterwards out of fear. But when I finally did start going back I always took pepper spray and didn't start going out until later in the day when there were others out there as well. I have no idea what was up with that guy or what he was going to do to me or trying to do but still all these years later I can't come up with anything feasible that wasn't likely to be seriously bad or who knows maybe would have ended my life. Also he never said anything he just chased me. I did call the police when I got home and told them what happened and they just took a note of what I reported and that was it. After that I never heard anything else. So 
My story is not one where I was the target of somebody else's stalking or harassment, but one where I was the guy who was just at the right place at the right time. And I'm fairly certain that my inadvertent intervention may have saved someone that I'd never met from, well, who knows what. So, this was back in 2015 or 2016. I'm a career tow truck driver, and at this point, I've been towing cars for almost most of my adult life, and will likely do so until I either retire or I pass away, whichever comes first. At the time, I was working for a, a pretty small towing company with only two employees, and we rotated who was on call each weekend. It was my weekend on call, and it was summer, so with people being out and about sort of late and whatnot, I was pretty busy that week. Cleaning up accidents, towing broken cars down both in the city and off the highway. I was fine with it, as I was paid commission at the time, so the more calls that I did, the more money I made. It was Saturday night, now Sunday morning, and it's around 2.30 or 3 in the morning, and like I said, I've been really busy. As such, I'm a bit tired, a little grumpy, and kind of want to just go home when my phone rings. It's uh, an insurance company calling, asking if we can do a tow for one of their customers who has broken down on the side of the highway. The breakdown location they gave me is about 15 miles out of town, which I normally wouldn't have done, but the tow destination happens to be a dealership that's just a couple of minutes from my apartment. I sort of contemplate rejecting the call, but because I'm paid commission, I figure screw it. I can run up and grab this car, drop it off around the corner from my place, then hopefully I can head home and get a couple of hours of shut-eye. So, in the end, I, I take the call and hop on the highway. The insurance company provided me with the customer's first name, Kara, and gave me a phone number for her. Usually I try to make contact with people who are on the side of the highway to let them know that I'm on my way and give them an ETA. I try calling her a couple of times, but she doesn't answer. Not completely unusual. After a short while though, I see hazard lights up the way on the shoulder, so I turn on my strobes and start slowing down. As I approach, I notice that not only is there the late model car that I'm looking for, but there's another car on the scene as well that doesn't have its hazards on, but is parked in front of the car that I'm meant to be towing. This is annoying, but not uncommon, as I need to be able to get in front of the disabled car in order to load it up, and sometimes people just don't realize that. But because the other car is there, I instead pull up behind both cars. You do this so that as the tow driver, you're the one that has to make the weird maneuver of pulling off the shoulder and back onto the shoulder, and that the other car just has to drive straight forward on the shoulder. Otherwise, if I pulled up in front, then the other car would have to go around me, and it's just unprofessional and unsafe to make them do that. Standing at the trunk of the late model car, which is now directly in front of me, are a man and a woman. The woman is probably maybe in her early 20s and dressed to the nines for a night out. She's about 5'1 or 5'2. She's wearing tight leatherish or something pants, a halter top, long black hair, very pretty. The man is probably around 5'10 and skinny, maybe 150 to 160 pounds, wearing a dark hoodie and dirty jeans. They're standing very close to facing each other. She has her arms crossed and he's leaning down talking to her. I step down out of my truck and approach them both and introduce myself. They separate a few feet and I look to the woman and say, Are you Kara? And she nods. I say that I'm here for her insurance company and ask what's going on with the car. Immediately the man pipes up and says, uh, Yeah, it's just having some fuel issues. It's an easy fix. Can you just drop it off at this commuter parking lot? I'm going to fix it up there for her. I'm rather annoyed at this to be honest because the commuter lot in question is further up the highway and I'm already 15 miles out of town. Like I said before, I only took this call because it was supposed to be coming back toward my apartment and I just really wanted to get home at this point. Not only that, but in order to change the original tow destination, I would have to call the insurance company back, wait on hold for who knows how long for a representative, and then on top of that, let them know of the change and try to get them to pay me extra for the deadhead miles back home after unloading. 
And I really, really didn't want to do any of this. And thirdly, this is a late model car. I'm no mechanic, but it's new enough for whatever is wrong with it that it's likely covered under warranty anyway. So the dealership is really the best place for it to go anyways. I explain all of this to the guy, but he's just not really having it. He even gets stern with me, saying something like, Look man, you just need to take the car where I tell you to take it. We go back and forth on this for maybe 60 seconds, and he's just getting madder. And well, you know what man, you're not the named insured, Kara is. The easy way to settle this is to just ask what she wants me to do with the car, and whatever she wants is what I'll do. Fingers crossed, she'll want to take it to the dealership so I can just get home sooner. I turn to look at Kara to ask her that question, and I don't see her right away. She's no longer standing where she was just a minute ago. She was slightly off to my right. I continue to not see her until I've turned almost all the way around because now she's standing directly behind me. And by directly, I mean within an inch of my back, arms still crossed. I look down at her and she locks eyes with me and her eyes are as wide as plates, almost owl-like and immediately it feels like she's just staring into my soul. She didn't say a word and to be honest, she didn't have to. I took a step back and did what felt like a, a double double take I guess. I looked at him, then at her, then at him again and then back at her and it slowly started to dawn on me that maybe something just wasn't right. I asked her, do you know this guy? And she ever so slightly shook her head no and the expression on her face when I asked her that will be forever burned in my skull. I turned to the guy and was like, oh, you gotta go, man. Now, I'm not a tough guy. I'm a total beta male, to be honest. If there's such a thing, I guess. And I don't care who knows it. I've got nothing to prove. I'm super reversed to confrontation and will run at the first sign of trouble. And I'm not exactly the biggest of guys either. I am, however, what I like to call sturdy, I guess. I'm 5'8 and 240 pounds. I have a bit of a gut, but I also have big thighs and broad shoulders, and people are generally surprised to find out that I weigh as much as I do. And quite honestly, I think that might have been my saving grace for what happened next. Because without a word, the guy starts to move for Kara, and I move to stay in between them. He tries to push me out of the way by shoving me in my chest, but because I believe he underestimated my weight, only pushed me hard enough to make me take a single step back. Immediately, I took that step forward towards him and body checked him hard, as hard as I could really, hard enough to completely knock him over, basically onto his butt. Because we rotated during the back and forth push bit, Kara is now in front of me to my right, somewhat between me and the guy who's trying to scramble to his feet. I reached out and snatched the poor girl up by her wrist, spun her towards my truck and yelled for her to get into the driver's seat. And she does. I turn back to the guy who's standing up again at this point, and he's breathing really hard. He gets right up in my face but doesn't do anything, just breathes at me. I stare him right in his face and mustering up the best dad voice I can muster just say, you need to go. Mind you, I'm shaking now and I'm absolutely terrified. I don't know if he has a weapon, I don't know if he's going to try to fight me, and I don't know what I would do if he did. Like I said, I'm not a tough guy, I really don't know how to fight, I've never been in a fight in my life. But what if I get badly hurt? What if I get stabbed? What do I even do now? I just want to go home, man. I wasn't even going to take this call. All this is running through my head at lightning speed. And after probably around 15 seconds or so, which felt like forever, he just kind of huffs a bit, smiles one of the creepiest smiles that I've ever seen, and starts to back off. He sort of sucks his teeth and rubs his hands together. He slowly walks backwards a few steps and then makes his way to the front of the car, gets in and just drives off. I just sort of stood there for a few seconds, motionless, watching him until... I could no longer see his taillights. 
I got Kara's car loaded up on the tow truck and as we made our way to the dealership, she told me through tears that her car had shut off while she was driving and she pulled onto the shoulder and called her parents because she was on their insurance. Her parents made the call to the insurance company who eventually dispatched me to her location. While she was waiting, a bit after she made the call, the guy pulled up in front of her and walked up to her passenger side window to try to talk to her, asking if she needed help, etc. And she told him that she was fine, that a tow truck was coming and she didn't need any help. He apparently persisted and she tried to tell him off and eventually tried to roll up the window. But apparently, he stuck his arm in the window and got the door unlocked and opened the door. In fear, she jumped out of the car, leaving her phone inside, and ran to the back of her car and stayed put there because it was in line of sight of the traffic. Apparently, too, he was really lewd with her, and whenever she tried to go back to the car, he would prevent her from getting in. Several minutes later, I showed up. And honestly, who knows what would have happened had the timing been any different. Her parents were waiting at the dealership when we arrived, and she told them what had just happened. Her parents gave me a $20 tip, which was all the cash that they had on them at the time. And Kara gave me a very tight and clearly heartfelt hug before I left. And after that, I never saw her again. But I tell you what, every guy has daydreamed at some point of coming to the rescue of a pretty girl in trouble, right? Myself included. You think that you're going to be a hero. You're going to slay the dragon and get the girl and ride off into the sunset like the king you are, right? But for me, being in that situation, in that moment, was one of the most terrible feelings that I've ever had. Forced into a confrontation that I didn't even want, nor was prepared for, not knowing what to expect from a clearly not well-hinged individual, I really, really did not feel like a hero that night. I felt like a, a scared little kid encountering a bully on the playground for the first time. If I'm ever in a situation like that again, I, I don't think I'll ever not intervene if I'm being honest. But I just really hope that I never have to do that ever again. So, to preface this story, I was about 15 to 16 years old at that time. It was my best friend's birthday, and she had invited about six of us over to play a few games, such as Mario Party, Mario Kart, Guitar Hero, etc., and stay the night in celebration of her big 16. At this get-together, there were five girls, including me and one boy. After a while, my best friend asked if we would like to go to the playground, which was about a 10 minute walk away from her house. And of course, being stupid teens, we agreed, not thinking about how it may be dangerous, since the majority of us were young girls and it was currently 10 p.m. Anyways, we walked down to this park and continued playing grounders when we arrived, which if you don't know is a game commonly played in elementary schools. The rules are that one person is it, and the person who is it must close their eyes and try to seek the other players as they hide on the playground equipment in order to tag them. But there's a catch. If someone gets off the equipment and the person who's it calls grounders while they're on the ground, then they're tagged. Yeah, I know, it's a pretty childish game, but it was fun. After a few rounds, we got bored and decided to huddle around in a circle in the center of the playground equipment. We were just talking, joking around, when suddenly I heard what I thought to be something like rocks. It was hitting the chain link fence that resided on the back of the playground. I sort of hushed the group, I looked over at my best friend asking if she heard that too, and as everyone looked at me like I had ten heads, she asked what I meant, and when I told her that it sounded like somebody was throwing rocks at the fence behind us, she responded with the classical, ooh, it's a murderer coming to get us. Naturally, I, I just glared at her, flipping her off. She knows I get paranoid sometimes, but I have a very good intuition and something just felt off. A few more minutes later, after some more rocks were thrown at the fence and I obsessively stared down the area behind the fence, which was all woods, beside the houses on the left and the right of the playground, in paranoia, I noticed a light weaving its way through the branches of the trees. 
At first I thought maybe it was just a, a headlight of a car that was coming down the street that connected to the street of the park since you can vaguely sort of see the headlights of oncoming traffic through them anyway. But I soon realized that there was only one light and it was bouncing up and down like it was being held by someone who was walking. I quickly pointed it out to the group around me as we all snapped our heads over in that direction. And coming up alongside of the nearby house on the left side of the park was a man who wore a hat, some white baggy and dirty sweatpants and a black coat. He was holding a flashlight, not the one on your phone but an actual flashlight. He was too far away to guess his age, even when he sat on the swings closer to the playground equipment that we were on. But we all collectively agreed that it was strange since he seemed, I guess from his clothes, to be at least mid-twenties and just sort of came out of the woods by himself to sit and stare at a load of kids. After a brief discussion, we agreed that maybe he was waiting for a ride or was just resting for a moment. And so we tried to brush off the fact that he was sitting and so intensely staring at us. However, we started to take note that after a few minutes of us resuming our very competitive game of grounders that this stranger was slowly inching his way closer to our group. He went from sitting on one of the swings furthest away to the next swing a bit closer to the equipment that we were on to the next until he was just about maybe 10 feet away from our game. Mind you, the whole time he just sat there watching us. At this point, all of us have noticed the strange man attempting to get closer to us and in an attempt to remove ourselves from a potentially dangerous situation, we made a group decision to just leave. Getting up, we all piled off the playground equipment and in pairs of two, we walked down the stairs on the side furthest away from the creepy man. As we attempted to casually walk away, I kept my eyes glued on this figure though and as we neared the end of the street, he got up. Slowly at first, the man started to trail behind us, keeping his distance. I decided to keep my mouth shut at the time because we were about to make a turn anyway. I thought that if he continues to follow us instead of going the other way, that I'd bring it up to the others. And wouldn't you know it, the creep stays hot on our heels, not only following which turn we took, but he also started sprinting towards us, screaming at us all amounts of expletives. At this point, the whole group bursts out into a sprint. The adrenaline that I felt made me run so fast that I was ahead of everyone else. Everyone was ushering each other to run. I didn't even take a second to see if the others were behind me. That was until I heard my best friend struggling to run. She has pretty bad asthma. I instantly felt horrible for running off on her, so I ran back by her side, grabbing her hand and quite literally dragging her along, repeating things like, deep breaths, you've got this, come on, we have to go now. This whole time, the man was still running and screaming behind us and was catching up quickly. At this point, both me and another girl in the group took it upon ourselves to get my best friend moving as fast as possible, both taking a hand and running at a pace that she could keep. Luckily, this park was only about a 10 minute walk away from my friend's house, even if that much. And as we all piled in through her garage door, I turned to see this delusional man start running up her driveway. He must have got about halfway up until our big fluffy savior ran to open the door. My friend's 100 pound fully grown German shepherd just lurched at the man barking as we gripped her collar in an attempt to keep her from running completely after this guy. Luckily, her sudden and loud appearance caused the man to freeze in fear before he just ran away down the dark lamp-lit street. We were obviously terrified for the rest of the night and only managed to sleep after putting random items next to us. We even had a rake, I think. But most comforting was our big fluffy hero, just in case the creep decided to come back that was. In the end, I really think we got lucky that night. Lucky that I saw the guy. Lucky that we didn't stick around in the park longer. Lucky that we were all able to run as quickly as we did, even my friend with asthma. Lucky that the dog came out when it did. And also lucky that the guy never came back.
when I was about 11 to 14 years old, I had a best friend named Spencer. Spencer had a decent sized family and he also had a big house. We hung out practically non-stop outside of school. He was homeschooled and I was in public school. And during the summer, I practically lived at their house. Spencer had an older brother named Keenan. Keenan was about five years older than him and I and I thought that he hung the moon pretty much. He was really cool and he listened to great music, played guitar and I always wanted to be around him. One summer though, when I was 13, Keenan went to summer camp. He was supposed to visit the Grand Canyon and go kayaking and do a ton of fun stuff and we were really jealous. It was weird too, not having him around all the time, since I basically stayed at the house the entire time and finally the day came when Spencer's dad was supposed to go to the airport to pick up Keenan and we were super stoked to hear about all the camp and stuff. His dad drove up and we ran downstairs to greet them and yet, we didn't see Keenan. His dad had tears running down his face and he exclaimed that he didn't make it. He didn't make it, you guys. And my heart dropped to my stomach and I started to panic. Keenan walked right up behind him and they both started laughing at this. Man, that was a terrible move on their behalf. But anyways, we helped him unload his luggage and stayed up until midnight talking about his summer he said that he had the time of his life and told us all about how he had almost went overboard whitewater rafting and how he surely would have drowned if he did. As two 13-year-old boys, we were enamored by Keenan and everything that he did. But we talked about how Spencer and I were going to go to the same camp once we turned 18 and it had been a long day and it was time for all of us to go to bed. Keenan told us that he would tell us more in the morning when he woke up. Now, I had fallen asleep and awoken in a cold sweat because of a nightmare that I had that night. And in my dream, Spencer and I had went out our entire day that day, just as we had before. Except when their dad showed up and joked about Keenan dying on his trip, he actually did die. Remember, this was practically my idol at the time and the dream was so vivid. I needed to go down and get some water just to calm myself down afterwards and I checked my phone before I headed to the kitchen. It was 3.30 a.m. The house was really dark and I had to tiptoe to be quiet and make sure not to wake anyone up. As I walked through the den on my way to the kitchen, I see the moonlight spilling into the living room, the only light in the house. And that's when I see what I think is a, a large silhouette and as I get closer and my eyes adjust, I see Keenan hanging from the ceiling fan. I freak out and run across the room in a dead sprint and turn the light on to see if my eyes are deceiving me, but when I did, it was him. Except he was asleep and standing in the middle of the room underneath the fan now with one of his arms raised straight up over his head. I never knew Keenan to sleepwalk before and luckily he snapped out of it before I tried to wake him up. He looked at me super confused. He looked around and noticed where he was and said, Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you guys. I guess I developed a bit of a sleepwalking habit at camp. He went back to bed at that point, but I'll never forget that night. I mean, how the heck was he hanging on that thing without it breaking down from the roof? And more importantly, how did he get up there in the first place? So, I've spent a lot of my life in Georgia and love hiking all over, but I must admit that North Carolina has the best mountains. For this reason, I frequently drive up there and hike and camp. This time, I went up with my family in an RV and stayed with them in the Maggie Valley. The next day, however, I had them drop me off about 10 miles away at the Cold Mountain Trailhead, and I'd planned to hike up, spend the night, and be back down in the morning. I was by no means inexperienced at hiking or camping, but I had never camped alone at this point. On top of that, I didn't bring a pistol, something I won't go without now, but anyway, on the way up the trail was surprisingly strenuous, not necessarily steep, I've hiked some steep stuff out west, but more like a ton of ups and downs and feeling like it just would never end. 
Eventually, it began to get darker and I realized that I needed to stop and set up while I still had light. So I stopped about a half a mile short of the summit and figured that I would continue in the morning. Nothing eventful happened. I set up camp in a really good spot, made my food and went into the tent. At this point, I realized that I hadn't run into a single other person my entire way up. This was an eerie at the time, but soon would be. I have trouble sleeping at the best of times, and usually lay awake for up to an hour trying to sleep. And during this time, I could have sworn that I heard someone lightly walking around the general area because of the rhythm of the steps. In the end, I just sort of brushed it off as my mind running wild, but I did pull out my big old knife out of my bag and put it next to me in the sleeping bag, just in case. That morning, I woke up and I ate some oatmeal, and as I ate, I looked over at my tent at some point, and I noticed that there was a strange bundle of like dried twigs and berries tied with green cord now propped up against my tent. Internally, I was half scared to death, but I quickly packed up my stuff and took off within five minutes. And no way was I bothering to go to the summit that day. I headed straight down, and on the way down, I realized that there was a pretty heavy fog, and I ended up on a, a side trail that eventually ended, and I got lost. I used a compass to eventually reorientate myself and found the trail again one of the biggest reliefs let me tell you and I made my way out there with no other incident however I came to find out the same morning that apparently a 27 year old person died on the same section of trail as me and it's possible that I would have run into him had I not gotten lost and rejoined the trail later and I guess that that's the scariest part knowing that someone knew where I was and watched me and I had no idea that they were even there. This happened about nine years ago. I was living with a roommate at the time in a townhouse in a suburb of Denver. My boyfriend at the time had always been kind of abusive with the occasional slap or pinning me down on the floor but after a family member that was close to him ended their own life, he really lost it. My ex, Pierce, just sort of lost it in the middle of an argument one day about a week after the funeral and threw me on the ground, hit my arm over and over, until there was a giant bruise on one shoulder and a handprint-shaped bruise on the other. My face also ended up being pretty swollen and I also had a bloody lip. My roommate called the police and he ended up being arrested and a no contact order was put in place. He was also ordered to go to counselling and maybe drug or alcohol meetings, even though at the time he didn't use. Fast forward a few months though, I'm living with this roommate because I was completely financially dependent upon him. She's taken it upon herself to pay for me to get my GED. That woman is honestly a saint. And a lot of my time was spent on studying for the subjects. After everything, I was very agoraphobic, but I even managed to forge some online friendships and maybe even something more with a genuinely kind guy. Now one day, Pierce's grandmother stopped by to take me to pay my phone bill. She lived close by in the same townhouse complex and was more or less right behind where I lived. I remember it being the first beautiful and slightly warm day after a long winter, so I opened all the blinds to let the sunlight in and left them open when I left. And after paying my phone bill, Pierce started calling her. I wasn't too concerned because I knew that he was supposed to be at his court-mandated counselling shortly anyway. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but his grandmother told him that we had just stopped at the McDonald's. Again, not an issue at this point. I continued to eat until maybe three minutes later when Pierce calls again. His grandma tells me that she's probably going to be home in about 10 minutes. The call ends, I finish my food, and we leave. Again, in the car, as I'm maybe two minutes away from where I live now, Pierce calls again. I still can't hear his side of the conversation, but his grandma tells him the intersection we had just passed, and suddenly I have this terrible sinking feeling in my stomach. I know that something is wrong, and... 
I just can't identify what it was, but I know in my heart of hearts that something is up. I considered asking his grandma for help, but for context, his grandmother, on multiple occasions, watched Pierce hit me or try to strangle me even, and openly expressed disgust at how I can't help but just get him angry. Anyway, his grandma pulls in front of where I live and I notice that all of the blinds I had opened are now closed. We go inside and once she leaves, I walk upstairs to my room and see a random Word document open on my computer. Pierce has written a whole long page worth of stuff, but I only pay attention to the big words at the top. It said, I read your emails. Immediately too, I, I just know that he's seen the emails between me and the guy that I'd met. And even though they weren't outright uh, sexual or flirty or anything, you could kind of tell that there was something there. But my brain stopped reading at this point and I needed to figure out if he's still in this building. Because there is no contact order and I know that he would have come in through the back door so nobody would see him. But my mind latches on to this idea that if the back door is locked, he's probably gone. I run downstairs to the door and see that it's locked. But as soon as I reach the door... I hear a closet sliding open from the room that I was just in, loud and angry footsteps, and he's yelling my name. Now, I know that this may sound weird, but I really can't call the exact details of what happened next. I remember his face in mind before I could understand what was happening. I remember being back up in that room again, I think to go through all of my emails with him, and I remember him slapping me hard in the face over and over until I just got dizzy. I remember somehow convincing him to let me use the phone to respond to one of the roommate's texts or something like that. I don't remember what I said, but I remember that she called right away. I remember Pierce standing two feet away from me and looking at me, believing that he was about to kill me, and my roommate asking me, are you safe? I only said no, and she told me that she was on her way and would be there as fast as she could. Eventually... Pierce became convinced that I had called the police and with a knife in his hands told me that if they were coming anyway that he might as well give me what I deserve. I managed to convince him that I didn't call the police and then he started crying about what a terrible person he was and threatened to end his own life. So with a handprint on my swollen face I tried to convince him that he wasn't terrible and to please not do this until my roommate came home. In the end, he left and I moved states, had my name changed, and I only feel safe in buildings in big cities where I'm at least three stories up now. It was a crazy time and I really don't wish it on anyone. This happened in South Carolina and... It's one of the worst experiences of my entire life, and I hadn't thought about it for a long time. Someone said that I should write a book of all the horrible things that have happened in my life because it should be more than a, a person can handle, but anyway, I was dating a guy for a couple of weeks, and we went to one of his friend's house in the middle of nowhere. It was a sort of run-down older mobile home, but who am I to judge? went in and there were four other guys there. I thought that that was a bit odd. I was the only girl but just shrugged it off. They wanted to play a drinking game and back then I was a little wild so I was game. And after about an hour things got really weird. I could see them looking at each other like there was an inside joke. I decided to get up and go to the bathroom and when I came out someone pushed me in a bedroom and locked the door. It was completely dark in there. I banged on the door telling them that this wasn't funny. The door opened and they all came in and shut the door behind them. I could sort of feel them grabbing at me and laughing. I was fighting and hitting but they were just way too strong. The door opened and they all left. I could then hear them outside in the hall and it didn't sound good. They were discussing the order that they would take turns on with me. The door opens and my mind is going a million miles a minute on how I'm going to survive this. The guy comes in and sat on the bed and said that he was going to get me out of there. 
He said that they went too far and he didn't know that they were going to hurt me. He said that he thought that it was a joke and that there was a back door across from the bedroom and he said for me to run through the woods as fast as I could to the road and he would come and find me. I ran as fast as I could and I heard them yelling for me to come back. I could hear them coming too. I got to the road and hid behind a tree. It seemed like maybe an hour had passed and I see a car pull up with him in it and he is just all bloody from head to toe. They had beat the ever-living daylights out of this guy for letting me go. He had my purse and ended up taking me home and I didn't know if I should trust him but really I, I had no other choice. I mean I was in the middle of the woods. I heard a couple of months later that apparently that same guy was arrested for killing his girlfriend and the guy who took me there was arrested for assault of another woman. Maybe if I had gone to the police, this may have never happened. Who knows? But what I can say for sure is that I got really, really lucky that day. When I met my ex-husband, Kenny, he was from a small town outside of the city. They are what you would call country folks, I guess. The whole family lived on a one-mile area and everyone had a plot of land that they built homes on. There were 10 acres each, so when we were married, we got our land on and built a beautiful house on it. My mother-in-law was married to a strange guy from what I could see. He didn't like to come to family functions and seemed to hate everyone, but he did have a friend named Denny. And when I met Denny, every spidey sense that I had just went off. I did not like this guy and I think that he could tell that too. He would go on and on about how much money he had and since he didn't have any family he was going to leave it to them. He was at their house every day pretty much except when he would go on these business trips and no one would hear from him for like weeks at a time. Then he would come back with all of this money and would buy everyone very expensive gifts. Now one day my ex says that Denny has cancer and well of course I felt bad about disliking him but still didn't want to be around him or anything. The next thing I know, they have Danny moved in and has a hospital bed set up in the office. Which was really, really strange, but Marilyn, my ex-mother-in-law, said that they needed to take care of him and in return, his life insurance policy of $1 million would go to them. Still, I didn't trust him, so one night I asked some questions. A lot of questions, in fact. Back then, the internet wasn't a big thing and very few cell phones were around. He had answers to every question, but I didn't believe him. So to win me over, he took Marilyn and I to the cancer ward with him for the treatment. We went into the waiting room and he walked up the stairs. About an hour later, he walks out. He even had some documents talking about his diagnosis. Still, something just wasn't right. He took us to his mother's house. He told us that she died and left the house to him. And no one was supposed to live there, but I saw milk on the counter. Yeah, I'm pretty nosy. He had hundreds of beanie babies all over the house too and gave us a bag full each. This is when they were really expensive too. Still though, I just didn't like the guy. One day he pops up and says that he has to go to Boston for business and wants Gary, my ex's stepfather, to go with him. But we didn't think anything about it, so off they go. A couple of days later, Gary calls Marilyn and says that he wants her to come to Boston to sign some papers or something. This all seemed really weird to me, so I decided that I was going to look into Danny. I went to his mother's house and she was home. And apparently, she wasn't dead. She told me that he had escaped from the mental hospital and that they'd been looking for this guy for months. And apparently this is when he was gone for like weeks at a time. Allegedly what was happening was that he would go to hospital and then would leave again. Apparently he wasn't rich either and he doesn't have cancer. All this had been just an elaborate scheme I guess, but why? I begged Marilyn not to go to Boston. I had this feeling of dread, but she said that she was going to confront him. A day later, she gets a credit card bill in the mail in her name maxed out. 
As she went to the bank and found out that there were several loans and credit cards taken out in her name. This is where he was getting the money from for the trips and the gifts. They also did a check and she had a million dollar life insurance policy on her name. Then, Kenny's younger sister comes to us and says that she woke up in the middle of the night and saw Danny and Gary in the backyard, apparently getting it on, and didn't say anything because she thought that it had just been a dream. So, they were in on it together by the looks of things, and what we were thinking is they tried to get Marilyn to Boston to be killed. She acted like nothing happened when Gary called, and she said that she couldn't get off work, and they came home to the police waiting on them. Gary denied everything and acted shock, and she let him back home. He knew that I was the one who stopped his plan too, and after that, he hated me with a passion. And I guess it just goes to show that no matter how much proof, you always have to trust your gut. Oh, and I talked to my ex-sister-in-law, and Danny... He's now in jail for murder because he murdered his lover's wife. So as far as I'm concerned, this was a close call for sure.